Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Man-like beasts appear in myths and legends of cultures around the globe. The best-known wild man phenomena of today is perhaps Sasquatch or Bigfoot in North America. But there are other legends such as the Yeti or the Abominable Snowman. They're said to live in the wilds of the Himalayan mountains. There are many lesser-known wild humanoid cryptids the Orange Pendek, which is said to live in the remote forests on the islands of Sumatra in western Onesia. Almas in Mongolian folklore, the Bukit Tima Monkey Man or the Ray Ren Man Monkey, which is a legendary Chinese relative of Bigfoot. The legend of Bigfoot and other wild men seem like a modern concept. The controversial and hotly debated Patterson film reportedly shows footage of a live Bigfoot taken in Orleans, California in the autumn of 1967. The widespread attention the film received brought the concept of Bigfoot into the public domain and into modern popular culture with movies and TV shows such as Harry and the Hendersons inspired by the hairy humanoid caught on tape. But these legends of wild men are not just a global phenomenon, they are an ancient one. Many of these myths have prevailed for hundreds of years being passed on from generation to generation as people swear to have seen evidence of the humanoids themselves. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of Fantasy. Sanctum Lights out. Murder at midnight. Presents Suspense. I am the whistler. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. And in between the stories, I bring you some of the best dark, creepy, and horrifying old-time radio shows from what I've collected over the years. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Both Greek and Roman myths are filled with sexually voracious wild men. The satyr and faun are both wild men associated with fertility. Both the Greek god Pan and his Roman equivalent Faunus are depictions of the wild man figure and both are gods of nature and the wild, but also of fertility. The Romans also described a Celtic figure called Dusios. They compared this pagan god to their god Faunus and the Greek god Pan, but are careful to emphasize the savage nature of Dusios to differentiate between him and their own wild men. Dusios is not just a fertility god, 
He is described as impregnating both animals and women, either by surprise or by force. Historians believe these figures are all rooted in ancient legends from Neolithic cultures across modern-day Europe and Russia. They point to the Slavic creature known as the Leshy, which is described as a short, humanoid forest guardian with a large, bushy beard and a tail. The Leshy is rumored to capture children and travelers if they do not respect his forest. Although some people have linked the Leshy and creatures like the Seder, the Leshy is not associated with fertility and is closer to our modern Bigfoot legends than the Greco-Roman concepts of wild men. There are many other examples of wild men in Eastern European and Russian mythology, dating back many hundreds of years, and these range from benevolent figures who are protectors of the forests and mountains to sinister and demonic wild men who inflict harm on anyone who discovers them. The Ural region of Russia has a legend of the Divnyai Layuti, who are beautiful wild people with the ability to tell the future, while the Kostroma Oblast region believe in the Short, a hideously grotesque-looking wild man with a thin tail and cloven hoofs who is inherently evil in nature and is considered to be a minion of Satan by Christians in the regions. In folk tales, the Chort often tries to trick people into selling their soul for trivial things. The legend of the wild man remained a part of European culture and sources from the 9th and 10th centuries. One Spanish source which describes the penance given for certain behaviors mentions the minor penalty faced by those who dressed up as wild men and took part in a dance, which was a resurgence of earlier pagan practice. Around the same time, in the 9th century, Irish folklore describes how a pagan king is driven mad when he attacks a Catholic bishop, eventually transforming into a beast who roams the woods. The Konungs Skuggsja, an educational Norwegian text from the 13th century, describes a creature very similar to other descriptions of wild men. The text says the strange creature was like a human, but with a great deal of coarse hair. It says the creature was captured in the woods in Ireland and that no one could tell if it understood human speech or not. These accounts of wild men from the earlier medieval period are once again varied. There is the godlike wild man echoing Pan and Faunus and the savage beast resembling a human like the Leshy. It is in this period that the earliest use of the wild man as a warning of the dangers of immorality survives, with the cautionary Irish tale warning that becoming a wild man is a fate anyone might suffer if they defy the church. The wild man was now firmly rooted in folklore, and the many roles he played were depicted in artwork through the later medieval period across Europe. The images all show a human with a thick pelt of hair, and the figure appears in embroidery, carvings, paintings, statues, stained glass, illuminated manuscripts, and even on more obscure objects such as a bread mold. Along with artwork, it's during the 14th century the term woodwos came into use as a way of describing a legendary wild man figure. The word is the origin of the modern surname Woodhouse but its etymology is somewhat unclear. Although wood definitely refers to woods or forests, the suffix wos has several potential meanings. The two most likely translations of wos are being and forlorn or abandoned person. This medieval wild man was described in sources such as Sir Gawain and the Green Knight as a hairy beast-like person and the woodwose appears in artwork of the time as a bestial and vicious creature. Thought just like the Enkidu in the Epic of Gilgamesh, this wild man can be tamed by the right person, usually a pure and virtuous young woman. The medieval European concept of a wild man drew on earlier sources, including the Roman faun, but the woodwose was also based on accounts written by ancient historians who documented actual creatures which were believed to be wild men. One such source for legends like the Woodwose is the Greek explorer Hanno, who traveled to the western coast of Africa in the 5th century BC, and we'll learn more about Hanno when Weird Darkness returns.
Imagine waking up one morning and when you look at your friends or loved ones, you see their ears, noses, and mouths stretched back with deep grooves on their foreheads, cheeks, and chins. All the people you know have suddenly turned into hideous, demonic creatures, and it's not even remotely close to Halloween. That's what one Tennessee man is experiencing right now. I talk about him in this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find at mindofmarlar.com. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the universe of the uncanny. We live on such a tiny surface of space and time and try so hard to shut out the mass that lies beyond. But when the whispers die out and the echoes cease, a force still fills the void that remains. Evil spirits, malignant and destructive, waiting in limbo to be summoned by the foolhardy. In our tale, a young and talented student of the Talmud turns to a secret body of occult doctrine, the Kabbalah, to conquer death itself. Simon, why do you punish yourself so? To reach an exalted state. I wish, I wish to attain the possession of a clear and sparkling diamond and melt it down in tears, then inhale its essence into my soul. I want to attain the rays of the third planet of beauty. I want to... I, I want to... I, I want... Two barrels of golden pieces for him who can only count in gold. Please, Simon. My father is not greedy. He only wants a bright future for me. And your bright future is paved with gold. Be careful, my son. You are on a slippery road. No holy powers will help you achieve what you want. If the holy powers will not, then I must... Don't, don't say it, Simon. You terrify me. Then I must find my way along another path. <laughs> mystery drama, The Demon Spirit, was especially adapted from the classic S. Ansky play, The Dybbuk, for the Mystery Theater by Milt Wissoff, and stars Norman Rose and Mason Adams. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. magic is rooted in the darkest corners of our mind and emerges only when we feel the insatiable need for power, money, love, any desire that becomes obsessive when withheld. It has always been so. Man has invoked the aid of spirits since he first evolved. What could be more natural for primitive man than the urge to call upon the supernatural when confronted with the sinister demons of wind, fire, and water? Civilization has only spread a thin veneer over this ancient instinct, a veneer that vanishes completely in our tale concerning a young theological student, pure spirit, who invokes terrible forces in his quest for love. It's Simon, Rabbi. I've returned. May I come in? Simon, Simon. Oh, come in, my son. Come in. Well, so you've finally come back. You look so pale and drawn. I've had a long, hard trip. Why did you stay away so long? It's been almost a year. We missed you. Yes, you mean you missed me. That's not true. Many regard you highly. But not enough to consider me as a prospective son-in-law. But Leia thinks well of you. Not enough to oppose her father's wishes. There are traditions, Simon. A daughter must obey her father. Well, it's time we change them. Now look, Simon. Sender is no monster. He merely wants what he thinks is best for his daughter. 
Uh, come, Simon. Let's talk about you. There's not much to say. Uh, you're a fool. A bright, intelligent, scholarly fool. Your brilliance was the talk of the community. And then you disappeared. Where did you vanish to? At first, I just... I just wandered aimlessly. And then... One day I heard about this small village where a great scholar and wonder worker lives. A man so steeped in the ritual and lore that he can make miracles. Mm -hmm. And did you find him? Yes, yes, Reb Meyer. I found him after months of wandering. Is he truly a worker of miracles? Even more wondrous than I had heard. Ah. Is your wonder worker a student of the Kabbalah? A master of it. He taught me that man can develop the divine spark within him until he masters the entire universe and all its forces. Mm, you're meddling with something beyond you, Simon. It shows in your fevered eyes, your gauntness. Don't dwell too deeply on these mysteries. Why not? The Kabbalah tears your soul away from the limits of the earth and lifts you to paradise. Now remember, only four wise men succeeded. Only one went in and came out again unscathed. One died, one went mad, and one lost his faith. I'm not frightened. They may have failed because they entered paradise for the wrong reason. I want to offer myself as a sacrifice, like the, like the great one who succeeded. But how can you compare yourself I to... make none. I will follow my own road. Good night. It's Laura. Oh, come in. Come in, my child. Ah, uh, how nice to see you. I'm not disturbing you, am I? Not at all. Uh, you remember Simon. Oh, well, of course I do. You've been away, Simon. Then you... you noticed. We missed you, even though you left without a word. There was nothing more to say. Red Mara, you promised to show me the embroidered curtains of the ark. And so I shall. Aren't... aren't you afraid to be in the temple so late at night? No. No, not afraid. Sad. And touched. The walls look as if they'd been wept over. I wish I could put my arms around this... Ancient, tear-stained wall and never leave. Tears are everywhere, Leia, not just here. And happiness, too. How does our Simon seem to you after his long absence? Pale. Have you been ill? Yes, but not of the body. But why do you punish yourself so? To reach an exalted state. I wish... I wish to attain the possession of a clear and sparkling diamond and melt it in my tears. Then inhale its essence into my soul. I want to attain the rays of the third planet of beauty. I want... I want... I want two barrels of golden pieces for him who can only count and gold. Please, Simon. My father's not a greedy man. He only wants a bright future and for me. And your bright future is paved with gold. Be careful, my son. You're on a slippery road. No holy powers will help you achieve what you want. And if the holy powers will not, then I must... Don't say it, Simon. You terrify me. And I must find my way along another path. Red Meyer! Red Meyer! Ah, good day to you, Sender. What brings you to the marketplace? Don't you trust your servants? I was looking for you. I'm bursting with good news. Yes, I know, I know. How could you? I've just... In a closed community, nothing stays secret very long. Congratulations. Who is this paragon you've betrothed your daughter to? A fine young man. Completely worthy of becoming part of my family. Mm -hmm. I was curious. Uh, tell me, why did you stand in the way of Simon? Simon, but he's only a poor student. How would he fit... With the rich house of Sender? He loves Leia, and I'm sure that she loves him. She will love her bridegroom as well, I assure you. How can you guarantee what you cannot control? A heart is not a machine. I know my daughter. Red Meyer, I would like to talk to you about the arrangements for the wedding. No, 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 not here, Sender. Here one buys food and drink, not a life. Come to the temple, and we will talk. Simon, I have some food for you. And some news. Uh, Ramaya, I'm not, I'm not hungry. I'm afraid the news I have for you will it's not... not news to me. I was there with you at the market. Oh. I was there in spirit. I heard everything. Uh -huh. 
let her in, Simon, before she tears the walls down. Help me, help me with your prayers. Intercede for my daughter, the forlorn widow who has a death door. Please, I beseech you, help me. We will help pray me. and hope for the best. No, I need more than hope. I need help. And you shall have it. No, please, don't interfere, Simon. I must. Now, take this diagram I've drawn, mark it out around your daughter's bed, and the circle completely around, and the six-pointed star with a point toward her head. Slaughter a young fowl and touch her forehead with its freshly drawn blood. Stop! Stop that. I forbid this. What am I to do? He offers hope. I give you your daughter's life. Give me the diagram, Simon. I will follow you, and God bless you. Simon. Simon, I ask you not to interfere. You have gone too far. Not far enough. I still have a long way to go. But I am drawing nearer all the time. Watch, Rabbi. This is the Lord of the Gods. Lord of the universe, he whom the winds fear, thee I invoke, the bornless one, thee that didst create the earth and the heavens, the night and the day. Thou art the truth and matter, into the magic circle, power the hazel wand, shroud me with a cloak of darkness. Simon, Simon, come back before it is too late. He has covered me with the raven's wings. He has whispered the unnameable to me. I am master of many. The arts and skills. The black arts. Now, Rabbiah, when the curtain parts, all is visible, black and white alike. Oh, oh Simon, it is time to sleep now. I am tired. You must go now. I'm no longer welcome here. You are to me, my son, but not to this temple. Go now. I'm here, Reb Meyer, to discuss the arrangement. Uh, Sender, you are certain that you want to go through with the marriage? As certain as I have been of anything in my life. Sender! Sender, I have something to show you. Hmm? Look at this object in my hand. Why, it's a golden amulet. Don't you recognize it? Hmm. It looks like the one I presented to you on your birthday. But it cannot be. Well, why not? Because that was not gold, Reb Meyer. But it is the same amulet, Sender. Sender, I have worked a miracle. Something many men have tried to do all of their lives. I have turned base metal into gold. I don't believe but it. But it's true. Give me any object and I will convert it to gold for you. Think of it. I can make you rich beyond your wildest well, I dreams. I couldn't allow you. Please, Sender, take my offer. Please, all I want is Leia's hand in return. Impossible, I have given my word. Weigh your word against gold, no, Sender. No, I must weigh it against my daughter's happiness. And that is my concern above all. Thank you, Simon. I bear you no ill feelings, but my daughter will be married as soon as Reb Meyer can make the arrangements. How can that be, Reb Meyer? I've done everything. The fasting, I've worked with the word, the spells, the symbols, all in vain. Uh, what will be, will be, Simon. Stay with me now. But what remains for me? What is there I can still do? Black rider, fling back your hood. Demon and master, show me the way. Sh sh ah, I see. Thank you, the secret is revealed. I see you now. I see him, and I... Uh, I see... Oh, Simon. Simon, what is it? I have won. Ramai, I have won. The bride is mine. Ah! Oh. said there are four indispensable conditions to knowledge and power in the black arts. An intelligence illuminated by study, an intrepidity which nothing can check, a will which nothing can break, and a steadfastness nothing can corrupt. Simon, it seems, was master of all. Will he then prevail even after death? We shall know more when I return shortly with Act Two. How 
How can we explain the strength of superstition? Shall we ascribe it to the primitive, the ignorant? Then how can we explain the fact that British witch covens celebrated All Hallows' Eve before tremendous crowds with rites involving the magic circle, the magic knife, weird incantations, and all the other trappings of the occult? Many believe the origin and development of superstition are rooted in fact, that it exists and makes itself known to us. Perhaps we can shed some light on the subject. Fred Meyer, it's so hard for me to believe that he's gone. He is, my child. He's buried there. Uh, Poor Simon. Everything he did, he did with such intensity. He studied longer, prayed harder than any of my pupils. And his love? Was deeper than most. He died for it. I had a dream that I was wandering in the meadow when a storm arose, and I hid in a small hut until the rain stopped. It was very early morning, and the vapors rose over the fields, and as they swirled, they took shape. Fred Meyer, it was Simon that appeared in my dream. He called to me, but I couldn't hear, and then he, he beckoned to me to follow him. But when I did, I awoke. It was a dream. Nothing more. We must leave here at once. Answer me, Redmire. Is Simon stronger than death? Is he still here? No. No, Leia. He is dead. You must remember that. He is dead and he will never come to life again. And you must live, my child. You must live with the living. Come now. Let us go. I thought I heard him so clearly. We'll meet again, my bride. My beautiful Leia. No one can take you from me now. I'm so happy you could come, Red Meyer. This would be no wedding without you. How could I miss such an event? Did you happen to meet the groom's party? They should have been here by now. The bridegroom will arrive on time. That's not what you need worry about. What do you mean? Uh, nothing, nothing, Sander. I meant nothing. Return to your festivities. Ah, so I shall. Everyone! Everyone into the house! There are silver coins waiting for all of you there! Red Maya, please stay with Leia until I return. I will be here. Leia. Leia, child, you're white as a sheet. Did they tire you with the dancing? Well, it was all so violent. My head swam. I I grew faint. And then someone lifted me high in the air and carried me far, far away. Perhaps you should rest a while. I'll wait outside. No, no, Edmire. Stay. Don't think about demons and evil spirits. Go, Leia. Change your dress. The dancers have stained it. Freshen your beauty and prepare to meet your bridegroom. Not yet. Will you come with me in the cemetery? Why? To visit my mother. She died when I was still so young. I want to invite her to join my father in leading me to the wedding canopy. And afterward, she will dance with me. No, no, Leia, I forbid it. But it's the custom, Redmire. Customs are not rigid, my child. You will not dwell with the dead, but with the living. Then I will invite her from here. Beloved mother... I invite you to my wedding. Come and stand near me under the canopy. Who's there? Your father, dear. May I come in? Oh, father, of course. Why are you still sitting here, child? Oh, I was just thinking. Grandmother says I must go to the graveyard. Mm, you have my permission. But Red Meyer says I should not go. Ah, he's an old man, set in his ways. Go, child. Go to your mother and shed your tears. May I invite her to the wedding? Of course. And your grandfather as well. And I would also like to invite someone who is not related. It is forbidden. If you invite a stranger, the other dead may take offense. He's not a stranger. In our house, he was like... 
One of us. I think I hear. Yes, it is the wedding party. Your bridegroom, Menasha, he's arrived at last. But, Father, I not want now, to. Not now, not now, Leah. I must meet the wedding party. Well, hello. Wait there. I'm coming. Welcome, Menasha. How was the trip? Oh, we had a hard and bitter journey. We lost the road and wandered about the fields for a long time. Menasha, you're shivering. Are you cold? Yes, I felt this chill since I approached your town. Penetrates the marrow of my bones and fills me with a, an uncertain and unknown dread. What is it you fear? I, I don't know. Ah. Come, let's have a drink on your safe arrival. It will warm you and drive away the demon. Who is it? Open the door, Sender. What? What? What is she? What? What's happened? What is it, Redmire? It's Leia. Bring her in. What? Put her on the couch. My baby. What has happened? You can go now, all of you. What? What is it, Redmire? My God, is she? No, 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 no. She's in a coma. How still she is. How lovely. How did this happen? She. She went to the grave, despite my warning, and wept. And then suddenly she started to talk incoherently. No one could make out a word she was saying. And then she fainted. Oh. Oh. Leia. Leia, do you hear me? Everything will be all right. Who is it? This man. This is Menasha, your bridegroom. No, oh, that's a lie. He's not my bridegroom, nor will he ever be. My child, my child. What has come over you? I will not marry Menasha or any other man. I do not choose. Sleep. Sleep now, Leah. Sleep and rest. We will talk about this in the morning. But we were to be married at noon. Yes. Is it wise to delay? Not wise, perhaps, but necessary. If you value the life of your daughter. <laughs> the physician. He had to leave. There was no point in keeping him any longer. Did you do as I told you? Yes, yes, I summoned the wise man of Bratislav. He will come, but it will be days before he's here. Oh. Oh. Leia. Oh. Leia, oh. how do you feel? Oh, I'm tired. I'm so tired. Where am I? Where you have always been, in uh, your home. Turn down the light. Hmm. My eyes. I've been in dark places so ah, long. You're back now. God be praised. It was so cold where I've been. You'll feel better now that you're with us again. I feel nothing, Father. <clears throat> empty. Everything is so empty. I must go back again. Try I... to get out of bed, child. I have no place here. What's here. happening, Redmire? Her voice, say <clears throat> Leia, open your eyes. I cannot stay. I cannot stay. Wake up. Wake up, child. Listen to your father. You are not my father. You are not any part of me. Burning sulfur. I am filled with the smell of burning sulfur. In the name of God, Leia, come back. If I do, it will not be in that name. Redmire. Two days she lies there, and still no sign of the wise man. He will come, Sender. Be patient. Be patient? How can I? She was all I lived for. I have no patience either, Redmire. I love her so deeply. I cannot wait until we are man and wife. But you hardly know her. I know her as well as I have ever known anyone. She is dear to me. What more can I say? Open the door, Menasha. A good day to you, Reb Nissen. And a good day to you, Reb Meyer. Thank God you've come. We've waited so eagerly. That's not an easy journey from Bratislav, you know. You know. Uh, can I offer you something? No, no, no. I wish to examine your daughter first. Oh, poor child. She hardly seems more than that. How, how long has she had that mark on her cheek? I have never noticed it. It seems more like a shadow. Yes. A dark shadow. I've seen it before. I will try to rouse her. 
God's world is great and holy. The holiest land is the land of Israel. In the land of Israel, the holiest city is Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the holiest place was the temple. Holy, holy, unholy, unholy, and sacrilegious. Evil is the holy. Where have you come from, spirit? I have risen from repose to bring an end to all this. Who are you? I am Leah, daughter of Sender, beloved of Simon. Beloved of Menasha. Be quiet, Menasha. Do not interfere. Rest easy, spirit. Hear me out. At the edge of the world stands a tall mountain, and on the mountain lies a great rock, and from the rock flows a clear spring. At the other edge of the world is its heart, and it gazes at the cool spring and cannot have its fill of looking, but it cannot take the slightest step toward the spring. But I can... You are awake, uh, my child. Have I been sleeping? Yes, yes, you have for several days. I, I feel so tired. I'm so tired. I... Is she all right? Oh. Yes, yes, she sleeps naturally now. Oh, thank you, Rebness. And when she awakes, can we have the wedding ceremony? We must wait and see, Menasha. No, no, Rebmeyer. We must not wait. We must try the wedding as soon as possible. There is no time to lose. Help me, Father. I feel so of weak. Of course, my darling. I should have known. Here, take my arm. Stand by me, Mother. It is such a difficult way for me. She is here with you, as are all who love you. Friends. Friends, it's time for the ceremony. There's your Menasha. Look at him. So tall, so handsome. Take Father. We must hurry. As we stand under this canopy. I will not stand under it. Come closer, Leia. No. Sender, usher her under. Ready the candles for the sleeping dead to wake till they are burnt down and spent. This is our final song until we return where we belong. Be still, my child. In the name of the king, our lord, be still. Close the steps carefully, for this place is chosen ground. Seven times. We turn around within the magic circle. Seven times we turn about. Malasha, do you take this woman to be your wife? With all my heart. Leia, do you take this man for your husband? Never! Leia! Never! He's not my bridegroom! Rebire, Rebire, continue. Never! Holy bridegroom, protect me! Holy bridegroom, save me from this! I call upon you! Save me! Redmire, pronounce them man and wife! Redmire, you will never pronounce them man and wife. They do not belong with each other. Simon, is that you? I. It is Simon Redmire, come back for my destined bride, and I will never leave her again. You must not do this, Simon. Simon, what is happening here? Yes, Simon, my greedy friend. Simon, you murderer. You killed me, but you could not kill our love. Redmison, my daughter, she's gone mad. No, no, Sender, not mad. She has been possessed by a Dibuk. An evil spirit has control over her. The belief in possession is an ancient one. From the earliest times, men have been fascinated with the possibility that our earthly shell can be taken over by an alien form. And the horror of it haunts us, even today. How does a body become possessed? And how can we exercise it? We shall find out when I return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. How did this act of possession begin? Certainly the setting of the Dybbuk was its basis. 
A closed world which, despite its proximity to the 20th century, had not as yet purged itself of faith in magic making. A world heavily tarnished with superstition. And yet, it was a world pervaded by a mystic sense of the immediacy of God, of the miraculous, and the power of man. In such a world, the natural and the supernatural, the living and the dead, seem to flow across one another in a continual contact. A world where the daily routine of life absorbs and becomes a symbol of eternity. Please, Reb, listen. I know you're tired, but my daughter lies in grave danger. Her soul is at stake. I know. I know. The misery and anguish of the world reach out to me. Every plea pierces me as a needle, and I... I have no more strength. I can go no further. Rabbi, you cannot desert me in my hour of need. Help me. Save my child. If I can. Now, the Dibuk. You knew him well. He ate at my house regularly until he left one day. When he returned to our town, he was meddling with the Kabbalah and came to grief. By what powers? They say by evil spirits. Did you cause him pain or shame? Try, try to remember. I don't know, I don't know, I don't remember. All right, all right. Bring in the girl. Come in, Leah. Come in, my child. Don't you hear me? Come in. I won't. Leah, dearest, have pity. Don't shame me, come in. I want to obey, Father, but I cannot. Maiden, I command you, come in and sit down. Let me go. I refuse. Dibble, I command you to say, why did you enter the body of this maiden? I am her destined destiny. Our holy Torah forbids the dead to abide among the living. I am not dead. You are departed from our world. You are forbidden to return until the great ram's horn is heard. Therefore, I command you to leave the body of this girl. Rap, listen. I know how powerful you are. How invincible. I know that you can command the angels. But you cannot sway me. Wandering soul, I feel great pity for you. I will try to release you from destroying angels. But you must leave the body of this girl. I will not leave. Dibuk, soul of one who left our world, I command you to leave this body and in leaving not to harm her nor any other living creature. If you do not obey, I will proceed against you with anathema and excommunication. With all the powers of exorcism. I do not fear your anathemas, and I do not believe in your assurances. In the name of Almighty God, I charge you for the last time. Go, or I will give you over into the hands of the destroying angels. In the name of Almighty God, I am joined with my destined pride, and I will not part from her forever. Center. Send her have white robes brought. Bring seven ram's horns, seven black candles. Then take from the holy ark the seven sacred scrolls. Wait! Remnant, do you believe in justice? In justice and in truth? And I demand that Sender be brought before a rabbinical court. I demand a trial. On what charges? I charge Sender with spilling my blood. I am the son of Abraham the Rift. I bring charges of an obligation that Sender had to my father, which he did not fulfill. In that case, I will postpone the exorcism until tomorrow noon. Sender, do you remember the Dibuk's father, Abraham? But he's dead these many years. Know then that you will be summoned to trial to answer his charges. Heaven help me. What does he want of me? What should I do? You must accept the summons. I will do as you say. Send for the bridegroom and Nasha. He must be at the trial as well. When the Dibuk leaves, the marriage will take place. Almighty God, help me to find peace. <laughs> Judges, 
Judges, sit beside me. We can begin the trial. I call upon Sender. I am here, Reb Nissen. Will you accept the verdict of this court? Yes. Will you carry out our decision? I will. Sender, Abraham claims that in your youth, you were students, that your souls were bound together in loyal friendship. You were both married in the same week, and each of you pledged that if his wife should conceive and bear a child, the one a boy, the other a girl, the children should wed. Yes, it was so. He died soon after, but you grew rich and Abraham's son was poor. You turned your gaze from him and sought other matches for your daughter among families of wealth and station. Abraham saw how his son was plunged into despair and went wandering, seeking new ways. And the powers of blackness spread their nets for him and captured him. <laughs> Sender, Sender, did you hear the charges? What do you have to say in your defense? I have no words for my defense. None. But I beg my old comrade to spare my child. For I did nothing out of ill will, I swear to you, Abraham. After you departed, I did not know what happened to your wife. She left our village for the home of her people. I never knew she had a son. Abraham asks why, <laughs> when his son was received into your home. Sat at your table. You never inquired who he was. I do not know. But I can swear I was always drawn to him. Mm. Abraham declares that deep in your heart you recognize Simon. That is why you never asked who he was. You sought riches for your daughter, and in doing so, you thrust his son into the abyss. I cannot say. I have no answer. This tribunal has heard the arguments, and now delivers its verdict. Sender, you are held guilty on the charges brought by Abraham. <laughs> you will give half your wealth to the poor, and as long as you live, you will light a memorial candle on the anniversary of the death of Abraham and Simon, and recite the prayers for the dead as though they were your own children. Now... Let us proceed with the marriage ceremony. Dibuk, Dibuk, in the name of this holy congregation and the great Sanhedrin of Jerusalem, I command you for the last time to depart. I will not leave. Members of the congregation, don your robes. Sender, distribute the seven horns and the seven scrolls. Yes. yes. Stubborn spirit, since you are not humble unto our command, I give you over into the power of the higher spirits to expel you by force. Blow the ram's horns. Let me go. Do not drag me. Since the higher powers cannot conquer you, I will give you over into the middle powers that are neither good nor evil. Let them, by whatever cruel means at their disposal, tear you out. Sound the horns! excommunicated from all of Israel by the sentence of the angels, by the decree of the saints, we anathemize, cut off, and curse you. The Lord blot out his name under heaven and set him apart for destruction. Sound the horns. I can struggle no more. Do you submit? I submit. Do you promise of your own free will to depart and never return? I promise. Recite the prayer of the dead for me, who I have 
appointed time regards. Say Kaddish for your soul. <laughs> Do not be sad. Let your heart be light. And may holy cherubim cradle you in their wings. Do you hear? They're going to dance around the holy grave so that my dead mother may rejoice. Do not tremble, child. Do not be afraid. You are guarded by 60 giants with drawn swords. Our holy patriarchs protect you from evil. They are... But I, I cannot see you. A forbidden circle rings you round. Your voice sounds as sweet as the weeping of a violin on a silent night. Oh, who are you? I have forgotten. Only in your thoughts can I remember myself. I remember now. My heart was drawn to you as a bright star. On silent nights, I have shed sweet tears. And always in my dreams, I saw... Or was it you? It was. Yes, I remember. Your hair was soft and it glistened as though with tears. Day and night, I thought of you. Return to me, my bridegroom, my husband. I will carry you in death in my heart. And in my dreams, we will rock our unborn babes. We will sew them clothes and sing them lullabies. The wedding procession has started, Leia. We must go. They come to lead me to the canopy with a stranger. Come to me, my bridegroom. Oh, I see you. A light upon the wall. The barrier is broken. Come to me. I am coming. A great light flows about me. I am joined with you, my destined bridegroom. Oh. Too late. Blessed be the true judge. May their poor souls... Find rest. And so the demon bridegroom and his bride are joined until the great awakening. A small gravestone marks the place where Leia, daughter of Sender, is interred. But none of the villagers in the closed world believe it is her final resting place. Steeped in superstition, they cast an eye over the shoulder when they pass the grave. I'll be back shortly. We scoff at the supernatural, but not in the dark, when strange sounds echo. And even the most rational of us find more and more natural what was once deemed the supernatural. Minds have been linked across great separations of space without visible means of contact. If mental telepathy and magic shapes exist, why not other forces still branded as the supernatural? Our cast included Norman Rose, Mason Adams, Marion Seldes, Nat Poland, Joe Silver, and Jack Grimes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. Oh. Why did you leave the stage after the Chopin? I, I can't go on, Lottie. After performing a miracle, you can't go on. The entire audience is on its feet calling for you, and you can't go on. After what just happened? What did happen out there, Mr. Klein? It, it was as if... Oh... You're Anton Wahlberg. Yes. Well, go on. Tell me, what happened to you? Well, something, some force suddenly gripped my right arm, began to pull my hand, my, my right hand, off the keyboard. I, I I didn't know what was happening to me. I thought I was having some sort of seizure. I was going mad or I don't know what. And then? My left hand kept 
playing. You mean you kept playing with your left no, hand? No, 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 Lottie, no. My right arm, it was forced down to my side, and, and I was scared. I was so scared I couldn't have gone on playing with my left, and I didn't. It did. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. You can stay up to date on everything Weird Darkness by signing up for the email newsletter. Sign up for the Weird Darkness newsletter for free at WeirdDarkness.com. As I was telling you earlier, the medieval European concept of a wild man drew on earlier sources, including the Roman font, but the Woodwells was also based on accounts written by ancient historians who documented creatures which were believed to be wild men. One such source for legends like the Woodwos is the Greek explorer Hanno, who traveled to the western coast of Africa in the 5th century BC. Hanno described an island filled with hairy savages, predominantly female, known by the locals and now known as gorillas, and another source is the historian Pliny the Elder, who described another race of savage, human-like creatures in India, now known to be gibbons. The accounts of these creatures were passed down over time and contributed to myths and legends of wild men living free in the forests. It was not until 1902 that the mountain gorilla was finally confirmed to be real, and not just a local legend with no basis in reality. For people in medieval Europe, the descriptions of creatures like this, which had been exaggerated and passed on to people who had never seen them, must have been evidence that creatures like the Woodwos really were roaming the forests, even if it was only in far-off lands. Rumored encounters with wild men have resulted in myths, legends, and artwork, and in one case, the founding of a town. According to local legend, the German town of Wildeman was founded by miners in 1592. The miners claimed to have seen a gigantic wild man by the shore of the river Enersta. The wild man was swinging a fir tree as a club to defend his giant female companion from the strange men as they attempted to capture him and take him to show the local earl. They claimed that they were successful, but the wild man died on the journey to the earl. When they returned to the spot they had found him, they found a rich deposit of ore and the town was founded and named in his honor. In a further tribute, the coat of arms for Wildeman bears the image of a wild man, which was also a symbol for miners in Renaissance Germany and appears on a number of other coats of arms. 
we know today that the condition, hypertrichosis, is a condition causing excessive hair growth over the entire face and body. During the heyday of the freak show in the 19th and early 20th centuries, a number of people with hypertrichosis made a living as performers, where they were described as wild men and were showcased as having both animal and human traits. In 1537, Pedro Gonzalez was born in Tenerife, Spain. As a Renaissance man with hypertrichosis, he became known as a wild man or man of the woods, and by the end of his life he had become quite famous. Gonzalez became known as Petrus Gonsalves, and he was presented at just 10 years of age as a gift to King Henry II of France. Henry saw Pedro as a novelty and chose to educate him as a nobleman rather than treating him as an animal. He was taught a broad range of subjects, including Latin, and was better educated than many members of the aristocracy. While he lived at court in Paris for 40 years, he spent some time at the court of Margaret of Parma, who was regent of the Netherlands. It was here he met his wife, Lady Catherine. Just like many other wild men before him, Gonzalez was the inspiration for a new folktale. His relationship with Lady Catherine is believed by many to be the inspiration for the classic fairy tale Beauty and the Beast. While Petrus was given special attention by King Henry and his wife, he was still considered a wild man by many of his contemporaries, and they did not believe he was fully human. But his story is just one of hundreds, and the wild man is a concept which appears time after time throughout cultures worldwide. From the earliest surviving written legend, Epic of Gilgamesh, to theories about Bigfoot and other wild men today, there is something about the figure of a being which is both human and animal which fascinates us. The legends and folklore surrounding wild men has always been dichotomic. The wild man is representative of what humans would be without civilization. For some, that is cautionary. Without civilization, the wild man is a dangerous savage who kidnaps children or attacks innocent people. For others, the wild man is a romantic concept. In our known earliest contribution to literary fiction, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the eponymous hero, is first confronted and then befriended by the wild man Enkidu, who becomes his closest friend and ally. Enkidu is a central figure in the epic, in which he's described as an uncivilized savage who was raised by animals and lived with herds and game in the wild. He is the embodiment of the natural world and is the opposite of the cultured and eloquent hero Gilgamesh. Unlike many other wild men in other legends, Enkidu is able to be tamed. He is taught the ways of the civilized world by a prostitute, Shamit, after spending seven days enjoying her company, which resulted in the animals rejecting him when they sensed her human scent on him. He becomes a loyal companion to Gilgamesh, and his tragic death deeply affects the cultured hero, inspiring him to seek out immortality so he does not suffer the same fate. The fact a wild man plays such an important role in a tale as ancient as the Epic of Gilgamesh shows how inspiring the idea has always been to us. There has been a wealth of scholarly interpretation applied to the relationship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu, which in many ways is representative of humankind's dualistic relationship between civilization and nature itself. We've risen above the chaotic and predatory ways of the animal kingdom, or so we think, but we never truly escape being animals ourselves, at least in some sense. This is perhaps never more apparent than in instances where humans purportedly leave society in order to revert to a feral mode of existence, and hence the trope of the wild man in literature persists in order to remind us that we are but a few steps, or perhaps merely one unplanned stumble, from returning to the ways of our ancestors. The fact that some of us might choose to do it is at once fascinating to us and equally unsettling. I have the same fascination with stories of alleged wild people myself, and having grown up in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains in western North Carolina, 
It's not uncommon to occasionally hear stories about people living off the grid and subsisting naturally in remote parts of the American woodland. One story along these, a particular favorite as far as an alleged feral human reports go, was told by Jeff Holland, one of the authors of the book Weird Kentucky, who describes a very unusual encounter he had near Cloud Spitter Rock, Kentucky in 1990. And we'll tell you more about this strange encounter when Weird Darkness returns. You can find more Weird Darkness by searching for Weird Darkness wherever you listen to podcasts. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The Reverend Arthur Maydew worked very hard in a large parish for eleven months of the year. He was also a student and a man of no strong physique, so that when an opportunity was presented to him to take a holiday by exchanging his parsonage in a sprawling, dark, industrial town with the country living of another clergyman in the sunlit south, he was very glad to avail himself of it. Arthur Maydew had two daughters, the heroines of this story set in an English county shortly after the First World War. Both these girls rejoiced at the prospect of a period of quiet and rest in the pleasant country neighborhood of Overbury. But their dreams were shattered. From the gentle green acres, the Maydew sisters passed into the dark regions of terror that lie Beyond Midnight. Biotex. The new soak and pre-wash powder presents Beyond Midnight. Aren't quite lovely. Oh, Maggie, we shall persuade old Mr. Roberts to exchange Overbury for Father's Parish permanently. Oh, as if he would. The lovely place. These surroundings for Sheffield. Oh, Alice, who in all the world would make such a bargain? Look, that was a throng thrush. Did you see him? No. With eyes like yours, I'm surprised you did. <laughs> well, I will not wear spectacles. And if it contents me to say I saw a song thrush... Then a song thrush I saw. Oh. Do you think Father is contented here, Maggie? Of course. He has Mr. Roberts' library. What could content him more? Books, books, and more books. A hundred thousand books. <laughs> oh, how green it is up here. That wicked bottom down there, the glen. How long do you think it is? Oh, a mile. Oh, three quarters, perhaps. You must ask Smith. He knows all the county's history. Oh, I would not dream of asking Smith anything. He's quite stupid. Look, you see, that's the road which leads to Blaze's farm. Oh. Oh, I wish there were a few friendly neighbors, that's all. Then it would be paradise here. That's the only trouble. Once we've fully explored, what shall we do then? On this side of Bricket Bottom, there's nothing but Carew Court. And that's miles and miles and miles away. I wonder what he's like. Who? The owner, Lord Carew, of course. They say he's one of the wealthiest men in England. <laughs> I've heard tell that he doesn't have a handsome 25-year-old son, Maggie. Only a rather plain daughter. I was thinking nothing of the sort. I merely wondered what he was like. It is bleak, though, isn't it? All about her. Beautiful, yes. Bleak. Oh, come on. It's getting dark. We must... Tomorrow we'll explore right to Blaze's farm. 
Who knows? We may be treated to fresh, warm, creamy milk. Hey, look. Hmm? Look. How very curious. There's a house down there in the bottom, which we have never... Eastways, I've never noticed before. House? Well, do you see? We've walked along the path down there, but I... No, no. There's a girl there. You see? I don't see any house. Oh, you must be able to see it. A quaint-looking old-fashioned house. Red brick. Oh, just where the road bends to the right. See the garden? No. I certainly can't see a house. Oh, Alice, I am very sorry, but if you don't persuade Father to buy spectacles for you soon, you'll be incapable of seeing anything. Yes, yes, perhaps I can see a house, but, but the light is getting so bad. Oh, Maggie, we really must fly. All right, but tomorrow we shall come and explore it. Perhaps we shall meet some charming people, make new friends. Wait for me. Perhaps we may persuade Father to desert his books and come with us, too. We will meet the people. down the stairs like an elephant. It's your own fault. Oh, you told me to hurry. Here, don't stand. Sit down, rest it. Well, I wanted to go to the house. Father's forgotten all about visiting Overbury. We can go this morning. Oh, it's swelling. Oh, look. Oh, Maggie, it's so painful. Shan't leave the house this morning, that's evident. If you wish to explore, you must go alone. Maggie. Yes, Father. If we don't go now, we'll never get away. He's sure to want to go to Overbury. It's no good. I cannot stand. Go alone and tell me about it when you come back. If there is a house in Bricket Bottom, I swear I saw nothing. I shall see you soon. If there are pleasant people and we are invited to tea and your ankle still pains you tomorrow, we shall take the trap over. Maggie, you are so forward. Yeah, you are now. Don't try to walk. Preserve your ankle at all costs. I shall not be late. Tell Father I'm just walking. He will be cross if he thinks I have gone to the house of that man. Very old-fashioned, but oh, absolutely charming. Oh, and Alice, you should just see the garden. Oh, there are hollyhocks and roses and Canterbury bells and foxgloves. It is absolutely lovely. Darling little house, it's set close to the woods, just where the lane turns off to Blazes Farm. Oh, Alice, I saw the people too. An old lady and gentleman. The gentleman was sitting on the porch. We couldn't see him clearly, but the lady was in the garden tying up her flowers or, or weeding or something or the other. <laughs> oh, she looked up and smiled as I went by. Oh, Alice, I'm sure they are nice people. It would be awfully pleasant to make their acquaintance. And we shall, too. I shall make their acquaintance if it is the last thing I do. Hello. Hello. You're walking. The ankle is fully healed. I hobble. <laughs> What's the matter? Matter? Yes, you don't look yourself this morning. Father was not angry yesterday, was he? I'm sure he was not awfully keen on going into Overbury. No, no. Not angry. Well, I'm all right. Only I did not sleep very well. I kept on dreaming about the house. Such an odd dream, too. The house seemed to be home, and yet to be different. What? That house in Bricket Bottom? 
What on earth is the matter with you? You seem perfectly obsessed with the place. Hmm? Well, it is curious, isn't it? I mean, that we should only just have discovered it, and it looks to be lived in by nice people. I do wish we could get to know them. Hmm. There's going to be a storm. Oh, the swelling just will not go down. I went to the house. House? Oh, the house in Brickett Bottom. Well, I saw the old lady, and she is absolutely a darling. I believe she simply lives in that garden. Mind you, it's absolutely enchanting. <gasps> anyway, she came to her gate and talked with me, and she asked me to look at her flowers. She's terribly keen on flowers. Anyway, the thing is, oh, I was a little shy, I suppose, and she said, you needn't be afraid of me, my dear. I like to see young ladies about me, and my husband finds their society quite necessary to him. Oh, she's awfully attractive. Lovely silver hair. Anyway, she told me about herself and the colonel. Oh, that's her husband. He used to be in India, in the army. Paxton's their name. Colonel and Mrs. Paxton. She said they were awfully lonely at times, and she asked me to meet the colonel. I hope you didn't go in. Why not? Well, I, I don't like her asking you in that way. Well, I didn't actually go in because it was getting late. But... But what? I have accepted Mrs. Paxton's invitation to pay her a little visit tomorrow. Well, I do think you ought to find out a little more about them before you go calling, Maggie. Why? What on earth is the matter? They're lovely people. How do you know? Well, I'll tell you when I come home. Oh, you would have to go and hurt your ankle. Look, I'll go this afternoon just for a short visit. I'll be back for tea, and then we can have some croquet. You know how happy Father is when he plays croquet. Oh, Alice, don't look so disapproving. Maybe the Colonel and his lady have a handsome son. After all, you're getting awfully old, Alice. Twenty. Where is Maggie? Father? Where is Maggie? Out for a walk. And then she's bound to pay a call on some neighbours whom she has recently discovered. Neighbours? What neighbours? Mr. Roberts never spoke of any neighbours to me. Well, I don't know much about them. Maggie and I were out walking the other day, the day before I hurt my ankle, and we saw, at least she saw, a house in Brickett Bottom. Honestly, Father, I am so blind I what can't... House? It belongs to Colonel and Mrs. Paxton. In brick at bottom. A little red brick house. Maggie has made the acquaintance of the Paxtons. Perfectly all right. He's a retired Indian Army officer. Maggie went along this afternoon, but she said she'd be back long before this. Hmm. I am not too well pleased about this, Alice. Maggie should not be so impulsive and scrape acquaintance with unknown people. She said she'd be home early. Well, yes. Had there been nice neighbours at Brickett Bottom, I'm sure Mr. Roberts would have told us. It's getting late. It can have delayed her. You say she saw the house. You didn't. It was getting dark. You know how short-sighted I am. But surely you must have seen it at some other time. That is the strangest part of the whole affair, Father. We have often walked along there, but... Neither of us have ever seen the house till that evening. And as I said, it was getting dark. Father, perhaps we should ask Smith to harness the pony and bring Maggie back. I am not happy about her. I'm rather afraid, I must confess. I, I don't know why. Afraid of what? What could have gone wrong in a quiet place like this? Still, I, I will send Smith over for her. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, Smith! If you feel you can manage with that ankle of yours, perhaps you'll come too. Oh, 
poor dear departed mother always swore she would have preferred sons, less trouble. Oh, not that she wasn't terribly fond of her two daughters, of course, bless her so, but... Ah, Smith, I want you to harness a pony at once and go over to Colonel Paxton's house in Bricket Bottom and bring Miss Maydew home. Well, what are you waiting for, man? Go where, sir? To Colonel Paxton's house. Bring Miss Maggie home. I never heard of Colonel Paxton, sir. I don't know what else you mean. Alice, tell this fellow where your sister has gone to, and let us be off to fetch her. The Paxton's house man in Bricket Bottom, Colonel Paxton. Miss, you must know the house. You really must. Well, we saw it only the other day. At least Maggie saw it. I... Not too heavily on that ankle now, girl. Harness the pony at once. Yes, sir. Stupid man. Alice, is your ankle strong enough? Yes, father. Then you must show Smith where this house is. I, uh, I must own I'm worried, Alice. But why, father? Maggie merely went to pay a visit to the colonel and his wife. And why have I not heard of the colonel? Roberts would have informed me if there had been pleasant neighbors hereabouts. Ah, be that as it may. Come, let me help you. I shall find it difficult not to be stern with your sister when we meet her again. It depresses me, Alice, that I must own it depresses me. The country all around is beautiful, but I am much fond of this part. Well, where is the house? At the end of the road. It should be there. It's coming dark. Yet you remember no house, Smith. How long have you worked hereabouts? No, I on five and twenty years, sir. I shall be just with her, I promise you. Here we are. Smith, it's here. Just... This is the place? Yes, Father. But there's no house here. Sir? Huh? Look, sir. What? What part of a building? Here. And, and here, in the grass. Uh, there, there was a dwelling here at one time, a long time ago. There were terraces here running... Uh, what does it all mean, Alice? Are you sure of yourself, girl? You're not mistaken? Perhaps further... No, Father. I promised. It stood here, the house. Maggie pointed it out to me from... from up above. And she went to visit the Paxtons. Well, then where is Maggie? <laughs> Listen. Smith, uh... That was Maggie's voice. She's near and in some trouble. Where, where did it come from, Smith? Oh, I didn't hear anybody calling, sir. Alice, go back to the trap. Let me help you. Uh, Smith, we must search. Miss Maggie? Miss Maggie? Where are you? <laughs> Thank you. Call again. Where are you? Alice, drive on to Blaze's farm, bring help, ask Mr. Rumbold to come and his sons too if they're at home, and ask them to fetch lanterns. Father, she might have returned over the downs while we were going by road. Perhaps she saw us and called out. Drive to Blaze's farm, girl. Maggie. 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 May I offer you more tea, Mr. Roberts? Mm, uh, no, thank you, my child. No, thank you. Nothing. Four days. Nothing. Where? What can have happened to her, Roberts? The police have questioned the old woman. She saw her on the path to Bricket Bottom, but no one else has seen her since. She, the old woman, said 
What was it, Father? She described Maggie as smiling, but looking queer-like. The house. There is no house. And yet... <sighs> Have you ever heard any local gossip concerning this Colonel and Mrs. Paxton? No. I never heard mention of their names until... I think the cat needs more hot water, Father. Well, I'll tell you all I can about them, which is not very much, I fear. I am now nearly 75 years old, and for nearly 70 years no house has stood in Bricket Bottom. But when I was a very young child, there was an old-fashioned red brick house standing in a garden at the bend of the road, such as you have described. It was owned and lived in by a retired Indian soldier and his wife, a colonel and Mrs. Paxton. At the time I speak of, certain events having taken place at the house, and the old couple having died, it was sold by their heirs to Lord Carew, who shortly after pulled it down on the ground that it interfered with his shooting. The Paxtons were well known to my father, who was the clergyman here before me, and to the neighbourhood in general. They lived quietly and were not unpopular, but the colonel was supposed to possess a violent and vindictive temper. Their family consisted only of themselves and their daughter, the colonel's old army servant and his Eurasian wife. Well, I cannot tell you the details of what happened. I was only a child. My father never liked gossip, and in later years, when he talked to me on the subject, he always avoided any appearance of exaggeration or sensationalism. However, it is known that Miss Paxton fell in love and became engaged to a young man to whom her parents took a strong dislike. They used every possible means to break off the match, and many rumours were set on foot as to their conduct. Undue influence, even cruelty, were charged against them. I do not know the truth. All I can say is that Miss Paxton died, and a very bitter feeling against her parents sprang up. Yes, but Roberts, I pray you, what? Please let me continue. I know how shocked you are. This story, well, it may shed some light. I <laughs> My father never saw Paxton after his daughter's death and only saw Mrs. Paxton once or twice. He described her as an utterly broken woman and no one seemed at all surprised when she followed her daughter to the grave within three months. Paxton himself became a recluse. He was rarely if ever seen and himself died in a very short time. Some said by his own hand. He was buried like his wife and daughter in the churchyard of my church. <coughs> the property passed to a distant relative who came down to it for one night soon afterwards. He never came again. It said he conceived a violent dislike to the place. He sold it to Lord Carew, who later pulled it down, and the garden was left to relapse into a wilderness. Those are facts. But there, there is something more. I can see it in your face. You have the right to know. What I'm going to tell you now is rumour, vague and uncertain. About five years after the house had been pulled down, a young maid servant at Guru Court was out walking one afternoon. She was a newcomer to the district. On returning home to tea, she told her fellow servants that as she walked down Bricket Bottom, which place she described clearly, she passed a red brick house at the bend of the road, and that a kind-faced old lady had asked her to step in for a while. I don't know, dear. Miss Paxton, dear, 
and ask me in to load her flowers. This only a bright hair, lovely silver hair. Did this girl go in? No. She feared that she might be late back at the hall for tea. She never visited the bottom again. But two or three years after that, after my father's death, a travelling tinker and his wife and daughter camped for a night at the foot of the bottom. The girls strolled away up the glen to gather blackberries, and she was never seen nor heard of again. does not know the truth, then she may have run away voluntarily from her parents, although there was no known cause for her doing that. That is all I can tell you of either facts or rumors. All that I can do now is to pray for you. Beyond Midnight is presented every Friday night at half past nine by Biotex, the new soak and pre-wash powder. The program is adapted for broadcasting and produced by Michael McCabe. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla. And nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. A few minutes ago, we were talking about feral humans, and one story was told by Jeff Holland. He's one of the authors of the book Weird Kentucky, and he described a very unusual encounter that he had near Cloud Spitter Rock, Kentucky in 1990. The author encountered, face to face in the wilderness near Cloud Spitter Rock, an adult, about 30s, Caucasian male, walking in the woods naked but covered with mud, leaves, and vines which were matted into his hair and beard as well, giving him an almost absurd Swamp Thing appearance. He walked with a hunched, ape-like gait. He spotted me moments after I spotted him, and we stared at each other for what at the time felt like an eternity. Finally, he turned and fled. His eyes seemed to show some intelligence, but he was still extremely animal-like and seemingly unable to speak. I made no effort to follow him. The similarities between this case and the one above are striking. I've collected similar stories from locals in Slade about old mountain men and hippies who have lost their minds living deep in the mountains and reverting to an animal-like state. It stands to reason that naturists or other outdoor enthusiasts might begin to take their wilderness experiences a bit too seriously, and that such a thing could explain an incident like the one Holland describes here. It's an interesting story nonetheless, and it bears some similarity to similar reports of people who appear to have taken to living fairly in national parks and other remote areas of wilderness. Another story, albeit a tragic one, that has long held my attention in this regard has to do with the disappearance of Dennis Lloyd Martin a young boy who vanished while camping with his family on Father's Day weekend 
near the Cades Cove wilderness in 1969. A tremendous search effort that attempted to locate the missing boy yielded no results, apart from some strange conjectures. In particular, there was testimony provided by a Mr. Harold Key of Knoxville, Tennessee, who, along with his family, claimed that they had seen an odd, rough-looking man who appeared to be carrying something over his shoulder approximately nine miles from where Dennis went missing and on the same day of his disappearance. Years later, Dwight McCarter recounted this episode in his book Lost, A Ranger's Journal of Search and Rescue, which featured published diaries that he kept while the search effort had been underway. He lamented the fact that there hadn't been more interest shown in various aspects of the disappearance, and the rough-looking man seen by the Key family near the Rowans Creek trailhead that day had been one of them. Mr. Carter later told researcher David Paul Ides that he had known of wild men living in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park around that time, and by this he explicitly meant people living off the grid, noting that a member of the park ranger staff had been attacked by one of these men the previous year. In response to a video that I saw online a number of years ago that recounted some aspects of the Martin disappearance, a man named Tony Stansel recently commented on the interpretation that people living fairly in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park at the time might have played a factor in Martin's disappearance. My family is from the Georgia, South Carolina side of the Appalachian Mountains, Stansel said. I've heard all of my life that there are wild people in the mountains. There are people whose families have been there for centuries and they don't want to be part of society, and they know the area very well. This is a culture that, particularly earlier in the 1900s, where moonshiners were everywhere, especially during Prohibition, those kinds of people have no regard for civilization and don't like intruders," he wrote. There are also wild men who are criminals or escaped convicts that have lived in those woods for years and don't want to be found. Some members of Stancil's family have been in law enforcement and have told tales about the wild men that live there and the police know of them, but finding them is impossible. Of course, part of the reason that people who choose to live on the fringes of civilization are able to remain so well hidden has to do with the fact that the areas where they reside, like the remote corners of the Appalachian Mountains, are indeed very isolated regions. Thick forest growth and inaccessibility due to topographical features are only part of what makes the Appalachian Mountains so daunting. Add to this the potential for inclement climate, mostly during the winter months, and dangers presented by wildlife and other natural threats year-round. I don't think people realize how isolated some of those areas are, Stancil said, and someone familiar with the area could get through the woods quickly and stealthily. Stancil pointed out that, in the case of Dennis Martin, the boy's father jogged the Appalachian Trail looking for his son, while his father, Dennis's grandfather, walked to a ranger station to get help rounding out to a total of four hours. Anyone that may have gotten Dennis would have been deep in the woods by then. There are caves and pits. It's very sad, said Stancil, but it's definitely a good warning not to get yourself into a situation where you could be helpless. For many people who grew up near Appalachia, in the foothills, you know better than to get too deep in the woods. It's a very different world out there, and I agree with the narrator here. No need to imagine goblins and ghouls. Mankind is capable of doing far more sinister things. The unresolved status of stories like the Dennis Barton case and the speculations that build around them have helped maintain their status and fodder for online curiosity seekers over the years. The first and most obvious problem with this is that with the passage of time and distance, Many of us forget that these are heartbreaking, cold cases, and that the lives of countless families have been greatly affected by such things. Another that comes to mind, however, is that solution to such cases is often far simpler than most would expect. Retired park ranger Dwight McCarter, whom I referenced earlier, has shared his opinion over the years that Dennis probably became lost or disoriented 
and could have died of hypothermia while attempting to seek shelter from a storm that moved into the area shortly after he vanished. Such a scenario would greatly reduce the mystery and intrigue surrounding the case. But if we're being logical, it's also probably the most likely solution to the child's disappearance. There's also the chance, chance though it may be, that Martin might have been kidnapped. There's no direct evidence for this, but the anecdotal story of Harold Key's observation of the rough-looking man has caused McCarter and many others over the years to wonder. Which of course brings us back to one of the most frightening prospects in our world today, that the real monsters can be seen on every city street or near any park or playground. You could meet them walking along a river or on a hiking trail in the world's most remote corners, or they might live as close as the apartment right next door. They are, in other words, the monsters that walk on two legs, and they are by far the most formidable and dangerous monsters that exist in our modern world. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness and you want even more, you can check out the free audiobooks that I've narrated at WeirdDarkness.com. I've got free audiobooks there by Stephen King, H.P. Lovecraft, Charles Dickens, Robert Heinlein, and more. You can listen to all of the free audiobooks I've narrated on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. When Weird Darkness returns, in 1974, the Smurl family began a 15-year period of terror by an unknown entity. That story is up next. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Anne Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome to the Black Mass. Tonight, here is a tale about olden times, based, more or less, on the story by Montague Rhodes James, An Evening's Entertainment.
Nothing is more common form in old-fashioned books than the description of the window fireside, where the aged grandam narrates to the circle of children that hangs on her lips story after story of ghosts and fairies, and inspires her audience with a pleasing terror. But we're never allowed to know what the stories were. Here, then, is a problem which has long obsessed me, but I see no way of solving it finally. The aged grandams are gone, and the collectors of folklore began their work too late to save most of the actual stories which the grandams told. Yet such things don't easily die quite out, and imagination working on scattered hints may be able to devise a picture of just such an evening's entertainment. Let's see now. There's the fire burning brightly in the large stone fireplace. On the one side sits the squire, exhausted by a long day after the partridges, and replete with food and drink. On the other side, his old mother sits with her knitting, and the children, Charles and Fanny, are gathered about her knee. Oh, I want to wind Granny's yarn. You did it last time. No, you did it twice before that. Well, that doesn't count because... Oh, now, now, my dears. You must be very good and quiet or you'll wake your father. And you know what'll happen then. Oh, yes, I know. And be woundy, cross-tempered and send us off to bed. What's that? Fie on you, Charles. That's not a way to speak. Now, I was to have told you a story... But if you use such light words, I shan't. Oh, oh Granny, oh, please. Granny. Oh, please, we'll be... Shh, 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 shh. Oh, now I do believe you have woken your father. Uh, hey, look there, Mother. You, you can keep them brats quiet. Yes, John, yes, yes, it's too bad. I've been telling them if it happens again, off to bed they shall go. There now. You see, children, what did I tell you? You must be good and sit still. And I'll tell you what. Tomorrow you shall go a blackberry. <gasps> oh, and, and, and if you bring home a nice basket full, I'll make you some jam. Oh, yes, Granny, do. And, and I know where the best blackberries are. I, I saw them today. Oh, and where's that, Charles, dear? Uh, I know too, Granny. It, it's in the little lane. Well, it's it's in, in the little lane that goes up past Collins' cottage. Charles? Fanny, whatever you do, don't you dare to pick one single blackberry in that lane. Don't you know? There, how should you? What was I thinking of? Well, anyway, you both mind what I say. Oh, why, why, Granny? Why shouldn't we pick why them? Why shouldn't we pick them? Shh. Remember what I told your father. But, but well, Granny, why? why? Very well, then. I'll tell you about it. Only you mustn't interrupt. Here, Fanny, you can take the knots out of this skein for Granny. Uh, now, let me see. Oh, my, sounds like a storm blowing up outside, doesn't it, children? Well, no matter. We are safe and warm inside, aren't we? Well, now, that lane. All this, mind you, happened when I was quite a little girl. That lane was feared even then, and as far back as anyone can remember. And if something that happened to your granny on that lane is any indication, I've often wondered if there was any connection between what I saw and all that about Mr. Davis and his friend that I'm about to tell you. What did you see, yes, Granny? what did you see, Granny? What did you see? Well, you know that lane passes near to the top of that hill uh, where you've seen that old figure cut out in the crag? Well, I was passing along there one evening. I was already late getting home for my supper. But I remember seeing the currant and gooseberry bushes along the side leading to the top of the hill. The berries were ever so ripe and delicious. And before
before I realized I had followed them, tasting one bush, then another, near to the top of the hill. Then I stopped for a moment. I was sure I heard something. Voices, I thought. But I, I couldn't make out plainly because of the wind. I couldn't make out whether they were coming from the top of the hill or from inside. Somewhere inside the hill itself, voices singing or calling or something. I wasn't frightened at all at first, and I remember walking farther up to see where the sounds were coming from, and the farther up I went, the more it seemed the voices were coming from all around me, from below as well as above. Then, suddenly, you know all those strange old rocks around the top of that hill, Beside one of those rocks. No one believed me when I told the story later, or made out they didn't believe me. Well, what I saw was a hand, a whole arm reaching up from out of the earth. Now, they, they say that the hill had once been a burial place in ancient times, and that a skeleton arm could very well be unearthed by the rains. <laughs> but that was no skeleton arm. There was flesh on it, dark and old, and long nails, more like claws. Now you can believe me or not, but I say I saw that arm reaching up out of the earth. And it wasn't a dead arm. When I came nearer, I saw its fingers moving like it was in pain, like it was beckoning me to help it. The rest of it, out of the earth. Now, I, I told you that I wasn't afraid, and that's true, until I got so close that it almost touched me. But then, then suddenly, a terrible fear overcame me, and I ran, ran all the way down the hill. And I have never once set foot on that place since. Well, now, it was only a short while after that that the events I was going to tell you about began. Uh, careful, Fanny, not too close to the fire with that yarn. That's better. Well, now, up at the far end of that lane, let, let me see, is it on, is it on the right or the left-hand side as you go up? Oh, yes, the left-hand side. You'll find a little patch of bushes and rough ground in the field, and something like a broken old hedge round about, and the kind of gooseberry and currant bushes I told you about growing among it. Well... That means there was a cottage stood there, of course. And in that cottage, there lived a man named Davis. This Mr. Davis lived very much to himself. He, he didn't work for any of the farmers, having, as it seemed, enough money of his own to get along. But he'd go to town on market days. And one day he came back from market and brought a young man with him. And this young man and he lived together for some long time and, and went about together. And whether he just did the work of the house for Mr. Davis or whether Mr. Davis was his teacher in some way, nobody seemed to know. He was a pale young man and hadn't much to say for himself. Well, now, what? did those two men do with themselves? <laughs> of course, I, I can't tell you half the foolish things that the people got into their heads. And we know, don't we, that you mustn't speak evil when you aren't sure it's true, even when people are dead and gone. But as I said, 
those two were always about together, late and early, and there's one walk that they take regularly to the place on the hill that I just told you about. And it was noticed that in the summertime they'd camp out there all night. I remember once my father, that's your great-grandfather, told me he had spoken to Mr. Davis and his young friend one evening when he met them on the road. He asked them why they were so fond of going up there. Why? Why, sir, it's a wonderful old place, and I've always been fond of the old-fashioned things. And when him, my boy here and me are together there, it seems to bring back the old times so plain. Well, it may suit you, but I shouldn't like to be in a lonely place like that in the middle of the night. Oh, sir, we don't want for company at such times. That is to say, Mr. Davies and me is company enough for each other. Ain't it so, Master? Aye. Then there's a beautiful air there of a summer night, and you can see all the country round under the moon. Oh. It looks so different, seemingly, from what it do in the daytime. Them bars there, and them mounds, all over up there. Now, what would you think was the purpose of them, sir? Why, I've heard, Mr. Davis, that they're all graves. And I know when I've had occasion to plough up one, there's always been some old bones and pots turned up. But whose graves they are, I don't know. People say the ancient Romans were all about this country at one time. But whether they buried the people like that, I can't tell. Ah, oh, to be sure. Well, they look to me to be older like than the ancient Romans, and dress different. Uh, that's to say, according to the pictures, the Romans was in armor. And you didn't never find no armor, did you, sir? Uh, not by what you said. Well, I don't know that I mentioned anything about armor. But it's true, I don't remember to have found any. But you talk as if you'd seen them, Mr. Davis. Seen them, sir? That would be a difficult matter after all these years. Not but what I should like well enough to know more about them old times and people, and what they worshipped and all. Worshipped? Well, I dare say I've heard and read about them heathens and their worship, torture and dances, behavior lewd and ungodly, sacrifices. How oh, torture and dances, you say? Sacrifices, you say? Oh. Lewd and ungodly behavior. What manner do you suppose? Read about them, you say. Heathen, you say. That was the only time my father had much talk with Mr. Davis. It was around that time that people believed some sort of meetings went on at night time on that hill, and that those who went there were up to no good. And there was known to be others, besides Mr. Davis and his young man, I mean. And it was only guessed what really went on. Dances and torches, Not so close to the fire with the yarn, Fanny dear. Now mind what I say, else you find yourself going up in flames. Oh, don't stretch that skein so, Charles. Hold it loosely. That's it. Well, now. Well, I suppose it was a matter of three years that Mr. Davis and this young man went on living together. And then, all of a sudden... A dreadful thing happened. I don't know if I ought to tell you what it was. Oh, yes, yes so Granny, please, Granny, do please. Not. Well, then, you must promise not to get frightened and go screaming out into the middle of the night. Oh, no, we no, won't. we won't. Of course we will. One morning, very early, towards the turn of the year, I think it was in September... One of the woodmen had gone up to his work near the hillside just as it was getting light. And what he saw nearly drove the poor man out of his wits. 
He dropped everything he was carrying and, and ran as hard as ever he could straight down to the parsonage and woke up old Mr. White. Uh, parson, uh, Parson White, uh, Parson White. What is it, man? Hope. Quiet glory be, what's the matter with you? Oh, Parson, sir, come with me quickly. It's oh, horrible, it's horrible. Man. Oh, but what? you must come with me to see what's been done. What's been done? Calm, you're really quiet, darling. Tell me what it is, man. What have you oh, seen? Oh, in, in the little woods near the hill. Yes, oh, yes. Oh, so sir, I was going up to my work, and, and I saw it in a clearing. A white thing, what, what oh. looked like uh, through the mist. A white Like a man. Uh, like a man, sir. And when I came near, I saw it was a man. Mr. Davies, young man, sir. What? Oh, he, he, he was dressed in a sort of white gown, sir. And, oh, yes, he was, and he was hanging by his neck to the limb of the biggest oak. Quite, quite dead, sir. Glory be. But, but, but the real horrible thing, sir, was his hands. His hands. Oh, oh, I don't think there were any hands. What? No, I, I couldn't rightly see for, for the blood, sir. Oh, the blood. May the Lord bless us and save us. What a sight to behold! A demon's work, if ever I saw on himself before us! His left hand chopped clean off. Oh, if clean we can call it. Maybe cleansed would be the word for it. Cleansed, but for the right. Blood! Blood! Uh, oh, there, oh. Parson, there, just below. I hadn't seen before. Look, sir. What? Oh! The hatchet! Oh, the hatchet on the ground the here! Stuck with blood and bits of flesh. Horrible. Huh? Some flies on it already. Oh, don't touch it. Don't huh? touch it. Do you think, sir, that this is a murder? It's an abomination. Oh. An abomination, but I think it's his own act. I think so. You see here the rock over here? Huh? He, he could have jumped from it and. Oh. Yes, it must have been. You can see the saints, the blood. The hand! Aye, sir, tis the hand where he chopped it off. And there it lies. Oh, a sight, sir. Such a thing. Oh, and do you see, sir? Do you see it is grasping something? So it is. What with all so the blood can you make it out? Oh. It seems, it seems flesh. It seems part of a living body. Oh, sir, what do you think? God's mercy. I think it's no living body whose part this be. This is Mr. Davis's man, you say, on the tree. Ah, yes. I think we'd best, best find uh, what we can of of Mr. Davis himself. Oh, yes, sir. We'd better hurry, Come I think. Now. Come, Come on, sir. The cottage is down there. Oh, uh, on the hill, you see, in the, in the field over there. Well, now, the door of the cottage stood wide open. And the two men rushed in, not knowing what horrors to expect. Uh, Mr. Davis! Uh, Mr. Davis! Mr. Davis! When they came to the little room which served as a parlour... Oh! Lord, bless us and save us! What oh, they look, saw! Oh, oh, they would horror. not forget oh. the sight for the rest oh, of their many, lives! Many, 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 what they see? Well... There, oh, in the centre of the room... The work of the devil's own devil! ...was a table that had been set up as a kind of altar or place of torture and stretched across his feet in clamps attached to the foot and his wrists held at the corners above his head, spread out, naked, facing upwards, lay Mr. Davis. His body almost in shreds from a whip which lay beside him, a tangle of blood and flesh. But the worst of it, oh, the worst of it, the work of the axe. Just below the breastbone, the body had been sliced as far down and torn open, and inside the axe had hacked and slashed away. A part of the spine stuck up, but nothing else was recognisable except the blood. Oh, the blood everywhere. And the strangest thing of all... Do you see the, uh, the face, Woodman? Aye, sir, the most what? horrible part. What a mark on it. The eyes staring up. Oh. With the mouth open into a terrible grin. 
Oh. Did you see that twitch? Yes. The man, man can't still be alive and, oh, and no, breathing. And, and, and trying to speak, it seemed. Oh. Both men leaned close to hear and swore later what they heard. Though no one could make sense of it, but they swore. They saw the mouth move and the words barely audible come forth. Ah, again, again, more, more, oh, more. <laughs> Well, now, Fanny, you're shivering, dear, and so close to the fire. Uh, you should fetch a woolly from upstairs, dear. N no, Granny. I'm not cold. Well, here, you put Granny's shawl round you anyway. <sighs> That's it now. Uh, well, did, did they bury Mr. Davis? Did, did they bury Mr. Davis? Oh, that they did. And his young man together. That very night, but not in hallowed ground, as Parson White would have none of that, but up on the hill. And it was no proper burial either. Some of the men just dug a hole large enough and gathered rocks. Oh, only those few men needed for the task were there. They heard the bell. It's not coming from the church, Parson. No, we can all hear. It's coming from inside the hill. For the coming of them of their own. Aye, Parson. And when we dug the grave, we could swear, but for the darkness and only the candles lighting, we struck things that screamed and pulled oh, themselves yes, deeper into the earth. Oh, we, we've no place here. This isn't the Lord's ground. Oh. Quickly now, throw the bodies in. Right, yes. Cover them with rocks and oh. breath. And be away now, come on. And they did. But it wasn't exactly the end of the story. What what happened then, Granny? What's that sound, Granny? Do you hear it? Ah, the sound. I'm coming to that. Well, next morning, some of the town folks passing by saw those strange black patches on the road leading up the hill like a trail. They, they look to be alive like. Oh, how could they be? But they shimmer so. And when they went closer. Oh, God preserve us. Flies. Thousands of huge flies. I mean, look what they've been feeding on. Patches of blood from those bodies that were rolled up last oh, night. Where did they come from? Oh, there's never been so many flies about. Oh, oh look! Lifting up all along! Oh, the sky is black with that! Oh, 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 oh. They found the women, swollen beyond recognition, almost changed in shape, you might say, looking more like them horrible half-animal monsters you see pictures of in ancient books. But almost as fast as they came, they were gone, the blood cleaned from the road, and as some folks swore, taken back by the flies into the hill. Now, Charles. Yes, Granny. And Fanny. Yes, Granny. Now, I want you to pay special attention to what I'm going to tell you. You remember my saying about them blackberry bushes, not to pick a single blackberry? Yes, yes, yes Granny. Well, from what I'm going to tell you now, you can judge for yourselves. Now, I said those flies went back into the hill, or wherever they came from, but that wasn't the end of it. Some of them is always seen about up there. And it was one day, 
while I was courting your grandfather. We were walking up there among those very bushes, and one of them berries, at least I thought it was, seemed to come alive in my hand. I felt the sting that couldn't open my hand. Now I can only say what I know. A numbness went over me. I heard sounds. Then something like a terrible whip. I can't remember all that happened, but your grandfather says he had to hold me from doing things. And it was his own words that the very devil had gotten into me. Later, when I opened my hand and wiped the awful insect away, I couldn't tell. Whether the blood had come from me or the demon itself. So you both mind what I say and find your blackberries down in the hollow near the creek. Oh, but, but look at the time. Off with you, off with you to bed. Oh, oh Granny. Granny. Off with you now. Granny. Can, can we have a candle tonight? A candle? Certainly not. Now, off with you and, and Granny will come and tuck you in later. Go on. Oh, oh Granny. And, and no, Charles? Charles, the early Charles don't you frighten your sister up oh. there in the dark or there'll be no more stories for you. Uh, uh, mother, what's that? Oh, I've just sent them off to bed. Oh, you've been telling them those stories again. You, you know, Mother, that none of them is true. Where do you get them from? Well, some of it's true, and the rest... Well, it's like I take hold of something and pull gently, and the rest comes up all of its own. Mm. Well, well, I couldn't tell you where it comes from. Uh, I'm going to my bed, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see to locking up, Mother. Mm. Uh, good night. Oh, I'll see to it. Good night, Sonny. Ah, yes. I'll just sit a little while longer. Where? Ah, where do they come from? Where? Where? That was, we hope, an evening's entertainment by Montague Rhodes, James. Pat Franklin played Granny. Her children were played by Marion Winch and Arlene Sagan. The narrator and Parson White were played by Bernard Mays. Don LePage was Mr. Davis. And Frank Laverdi played Granny's father. Mr. Davis's young man and the woodman and the snoring father were played by Eric Bowersfeld, and the two ladies who were eaten by the flies were Arlene Sagan and Pat Franklin. The technical production for the story was by John Whiting, and the adaptation was by Eric Bowersfeld. And now, good night. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on, 
You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Beginning in 1974, the Smurl family went through one of the worst hauntings ever that lasted 15 years. For an intense two-year period, the family was subject to a series of physical assaults perpetrated allegedly by a mysterious demon and a horde of ghosts. The haunting affected everyone in the Smurl family. Even the dog had a run-in with one of the angry ghosts. Out of all the families that have claimed to be haunted over the years, the Smurls claim to deal with some of the most aggressive entities of the 20th century. These ghosts lasted for a great part of their lives. The haunting became so bad that the Catholic Church got involved in an attempt to exorcise the demon. Even after the Smurls called in demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren, they still weren't able to rid themselves of the horrible creatures that seemed set on ripping their family apart, and they ultimately lived with remnants of the haunting for the next 15 years, even after the most vicious attacks seemed to simmer. In the 1990s, the Warrens' experiences trying to rid the Smurls of their hauntings were turned into a made-for-TV movie called, appropriately, The Haunted. The Smurl family haunting facts include everything from ghosts attacking children to the demonologists who tried to stop them. The question remains as to whether there truly were evil forces at work and whether the demonologists held any sway over the atrocities these Smurls experienced. In 1974, Jack and Janet Smurl moved out of their flood-damaged home and into a West Pitson, Pennsylvania duplex that's been lovingly described by all sources as a fixer-upper. Jack, Janet, and their kids lived on one side of the duplex, while Jack's parents, John and Mary, lived on the other. It didn't take long for the haunting to start. The first instances of their ghostly visitors were benign. A tool would go missing. The stain on the wall would seep through the paint. Nothing too scary. But then, kitchen appliances started to go up in flames, even when they weren't plugged in. And then, there was the smell. The odor wafted through the house at random intervals and was absolutely stifling. During his investigation, Ed Warren described the smell as something akin to rotting flesh. Shortly after the haunting began, Mary suffered a heart attack and the family began to struggle in paying the bills. It seemed that the haunting was taking a toll on more than the family's living space. One of the creepiest ways in which the haunting manifested was the sound of it. Moans and blood-curdling screams ripped through the house at all hours of the day and night. Many of the chilling sounds reportedly took on the voices of the Smurl family, a particularly cruel way to haunt the family. It wasn't just the Smurls who heard the ghostly sounds. Allegedly, their neighbors claimed to hear screams coming from inside the house when no one was home. As the weeks went on, the haunting increased from sounds to floating black creatures and shadow people. Self-taught, self-proclaimed demonologist Ed Warren later claimed that he saw a mucus-like, smoky-type substance that began to whirl and materialize on the mirror, spelling out filthy obscenities, telling me in no uncertain terms to get out of the house. The creature, or creatures, haunting the Smurl family were hell-bent on ripping the family apart. The worst indignity suffered by both Jack and Janet were separate sexual assaults that happened numerous times. First, Janet claimed she was woken in the middle of the night by an unknown figure sexually assaulting her. Then Jack claimed that while he was watching a baseball game in the living room, 
he was also assaulted in the same way by a succubus. He later claimed that while he attempted to say the rosary, the creature dragged him around his room. During the 15-year haunting, no one in the Smurl family made it out of the haunting without being harmed. One of the daughters was sliced open by a flying wall fixture, and the family's German shepherd was thrown against the wall. Janet claims that she was grabbed by the creature before being hurled across her living room. On another occasion, an invisible entity bit Jack in the face and threw another one of their daughters down a set of stairs. The skeptic's view of this situation says that all these attacks are similar to those of domestic violence. It's completely understandable that the Smurls may have been in the middle of a turbulent marriage and that they were covering their screaming matches and physical altercations with an interesting ghost story, but nothing like this has ever been verified. As with all hauntings in the 70s and 80s, the Warrens, yes, they of Amityville horror, finally worked their way into the story. Supposedly, the Smurls were reluctant about calling the Warrens because they were worried about drawing unwanted attention to themselves. After the investigation, Ed Warren said, "...the Smurls are truly a family coming under a visual attack. The ghost, devil, demon, or whatever you call it, is in that home." Ed Warren claimed that on his very first night in the home, he experienced a major cold spot and saw a shadow person. He explained, I did not have to wait moments when the very thing I felt was a drop in temperature of at least 30-some degrees. Then a dark mass formed about three feet in front of me. After the appearance of the shadow person, Ed Warren claimed that something in the home began throwing things around the house, including the mattresses in the master bedroom. Judging from the amount of stories that came out of the Smurl haunting, it seems like there wasn't a day that went by without something creepy happening. Janet Spurrow claimed that while she was in the kitchen one evening, the house grew cold and she felt a hideous presence. That is when a black, human-shaped form appeared in her kitchen. It had no face, but it was more tangible than a shadow. The shape passed through her wall and appeared to marry on the other side of the duplex. Whatever was haunting the Smurls, it absolutely hated religious iconography. One night, the Warrens tried to draw out one of the entities with a group prayer and they got more than they bargained for. In the middle of the prayer, something began screeching, you filthy bastard, get out of this house! And then the house started shaking and two female ghosts that looked to be from colonial America slunk through the house. This was the only time that the appearances of the colonial ghosts were recorded, but it's possible that one of these two was the succubus that had assaulted Jack while he watched a baseball game. Try as they might, the Smurls couldn't shake the ghosts that made their every waking moment total hell. Even though priests and the Scranton branch of the Roman Catholic Church blessed the home and formed multiple exorcisms on the house, the family continued to experience pure terror. Despite priests saying that they saw no harmful activity while on the property, Janet claims that the demons were able to avoid their Catholic banishment by moving back and forth between the two sides of the duplex. After 15 years of being harassed by invisible entities, the Smurls finally moved to Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. There are no reports as to whether or not they ever experienced another haunting. After an in-depth investigation of the Smurl home, the Warrens were able to pin down exactly what was assaulting the family, more or less. Lorraine Warren, a clairvoyant, claimed that there were definitely four entities roaming the duplex. The first was an elderly woman who mostly kept to herself. There was also an older man who died in the home, which is oddly similar to the Enfield haunting, the case that the Warrens also investigated. Lorraine said the violence that the family experienced came from the ghost of a young woman and a demon who was able to control the other entities. Even though the Warrens claimed that the Smurl family was haunted by a gang of ghosts led by a demon, there is another explanation for the nearly two decades of terror – a mass hallucination. Apparently, in 1983, Jack Smurl went under the knife for complications stemming from a case of meningitis that he'd had as a child. Smurl said the doctors were trying to remove water from his brain. 
It's possible that Jack had a brain tumor, and that is why he was experiencing such violent attacks. But the Warrens' stories don't really corroborate this. Professor Paul Kurtz of State University of New York at Buffalo believes that the haunting started with Smurl's brain impairment and that the rest of the family followed suit. It's possible that the family fell under the delusion through which Jack Smurl was living, but that doesn't explain why they would follow along with his bonkers behavior for more than a decade. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Thirteen, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box thirteen, box thirteen, box thirteen, box thirteen. Box 13. Copy, boy. Copy, boy. Hi, Mr. Holiday. What do you say? Where's that society page, please? Hiya, Holiday. Hiya. Jerk the first paragraph in that Simmons story. Hiya, Dan. How are you? Hiya, Susie. Hiya, Mr. Holiday. What's in box 13? You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. <laughs> Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, here I am again, standing at the want ad counter of the Star Times, looking for what? An idea for a story. I could have stayed here as a reporter. I could have been searching for facts, instead I'm fumbling for fiction. Instead of a blonde, I'm meeting a deadline. Instead of Chanel number five, I'm heading for a sniff of printer's ink. Holiday, you're a dope. Mr. Holiday. I. What's that, Susie? I said there's a letter in box 13 for you. It's special. Special? Special delivery. It was mailed only a couple of hours ago. Something like that could be important. Hmm, could be. Could be adventure. Could be. Could be a. a girl. Could be. <laughs> By the way, Susie, how come you're working so late this evening? Oh, my boss asked me to. He's paying me overtime. Time and three quarters. Time and three quarters? Mm-hmm. I held out for double time when he offered me time and a half. Well, what happened? Oh, we effected a compromise. <laughs> Goodbye, Susie. Special delivery, huh? Well, this could be very important. Also, it couldn't. Come on, open it up, Holiday. You haven't got all night. I'm in terrible trouble. Please come to room 718 at the Bradford Hotel. Hurry. Signed, Agatha Marsh. Hmm, that sounds urgent. Mr. 
Who are you, young man? What do you want? I'm the man from Box 13. I'm looking for Agatha Marsh. I'm Agatha Marsh. Come in, come in. You're Agatha Marsh? Well, don't stand there with your mouth open. Never can tell who might be snooping around the hall. Find a chair and sit down. Now, what's your name? Uh, oh, Dan Holliday. Well, Mr. Holliday, I don't believe in drinking or I'd offer you one, but I have got some sauerkraut juice in my thermos bottle. Oh, uh, no, thanks. Just the same. I like you, Mr. Holliday. I liked your ad in the paper. Adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. It was just what I needed. Well, thanks again. Now then, what's your charge? Charge? For helping me, your fee. Oh, that. No charge, Miss Marsh. Are you trying to be chivalrous? No, you see, I'm a writer. I'm looking for ideas. If I get a good idea, I consider I've been well paid. Well, that seems a little silly. Might I ask just what your trouble is? Oh, you don't think a girl my age could get into trouble, do you? Well, you look like a very charming old... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, lady, oh, lady, let's not beat around the bush. Now, no doubt you want to know a few things about me. Well, that would be very interesting. Yes, well, I live in Muncie, Indiana, alone. I've got a big house and an independent income. Every year I go someplace for a vacation, and this year I came here. Uh, is that all? Isn't that enough? But the letter you wrote me, you said you were in terrible trouble. Well, I am. If anyone ever finds out about this, I don't know what'll happen. Finds out about what? Come over here to the closet. I want to show you something. Look. On the floor. Well, that's a dead man lying there. Well, this would make a good opening chapter for a story. Young man goes to help charming old lady who is in terrible trouble. Terrible trouble turns out to be a corpse. Corpse? Hey, wake up, Holiday. This is the real thing. Now. Now do you believe me, young man? When did you find him? Just before I wrote you that letter. Before you wrote the letter? Well, that's hours ago. I know, but what could I do? What could you do? Miss Marsh, you could call the police. And get my name in the papers. Have all the folks back in Muncie know there was a dead man in my room? Oh, no. Miss Marsh, listen to me, please. There's a dead man in that closet. There's a law about dead men. We have to notify the police immediately. You can go to jail for hiding a body. Oh, fiddlesticks. But, Miss Marsh, look at this man. He's been shot at close range. There are powder burns on his coat. I know. I examined him before I wrote you. You see, I read all the current detective stories. Detective stories? This isn't a story. This is the real thing. I know. Why don't you try to prove that I did it? With what? A cap pistol? Now, you're a nice person, Miss Marsh, but this is going to be tough. Well, don't get so excited. A girl my age could kill a man if she wanted to. Um, rub him out, as they say in the murder mysteries. Please, Miss Marsh, be sensible. You've got a murdered man in your closet. Now pick up that phone and call the police right away. Mr. Holliday, in all seriousness, I can't do it. Think of what my lifelong friends would say. Yes, yes, I know it doesn't look I good. I can see the headlines now. Prominent Muncie pioneer woman found with dead body in hotel. Oh, please, Mr. Holliday, help me. Well, I don't know. This is a little out of my department. Just this once, Mr. Holliday. I've never asked for help before. I, I'm an old woman. Well, all right. What do you want me to do? I want you to help me get rid of the body. Get rid of the body. Now, look, Miss Marsh, you're not serious. You didn't mean that. Oh, you don't know me. I fully intend to get rid of that body. Okay, go right ahead. It's your corpse. And you're going to help me. No, no, I'm sorry. Try a bell. And have him snitch to the desk clerk. Besides, you advertise for adventure. But this isn't adventure. It's a nightmare. Come on, Miss Marsh. Let me notify the police. Now, there's a broom closet down the hall. That's very interesting. I, I, I just remember I'm... I'm meeting someone in the lobby. I'd take the body there myself, but I'm not strong enough. Goodbye, Miss Marsh. I'll scream. Go right ahead. The hotel detective will show up. Just a man I'd love to see. And I'll tell him you killed that man. Oh. Now, would you help me? Suppose we get caught. Then you'll help me. Now, wait a minute. You said we. Now, I'll open the door and watch the hall. Uh, case the joint, as they say in the mysteries. And then you whisk the body into the closet. You're strong. You can do it. Oh, sure. I'm strong, all right. But not in the head. Oh, this can't be happening to you, Holiday. You can't be dragging a body down the hall of the Bradford Hotel. You know better. 
And as soon as you can get away from this charming but cracked old gal, you're going to talk to the police. Harry. Harry. Now, I'll open the closet door. Put him in right there. Stick him in good. I must be crazy. Oh, good, good. Now back into my room before anybody sees us. There. Wasn't that easy? Easy, she says. Well, I must say you carry out your part very well. What's next in this little scheme of yours, Miss Marsh? Why don't you know? We have to find out who killed that Michael O'Brien. You know who he is? Well, I do now. I went through his pockets. Frisked him, as they say in the stories. Well, that cuts it. You stay here. I'm going downstairs. Who's that? Just keep cool. I'll handle everything. Oh, I can't believe this. It just can't happen. My name is Kling, Lieutenant Homicide Bureau. Oh, come in. Come in, won't you? I intend to. Holiday, what are you doing here? Hello, Lieutenant. Oh, do you two know each other? Never mind the social chatter. I thought this was some kind of a gag. Now I'm sure of it. Holiday, just what are you trying to dream up? If I told you, Kling, you'd never believe me. Sit down, Lieutenant. Uh, can I get you some sauerkraut juice? Well, I don't mind if... Uh, some what? Sauerkraut juice. Uh, no, thanks. Now listen, somebody, some crackpot phoned in a tip that there was a dead man in this room. Why, Lieutenant, how can you say such things? Lieutenant, now listen. You'll be quiet. Miss Marsh, mind if I have a look around? Not at all, not at all. Here's the closet. Now then, you can see for yourself, Lieutenant, there's nobody there. Uh, I got your name from the desk clerk, Miss Marsh. Maybe you better tell me about yourself. I can tell you all about it. I was talking to Miss Marsh. Are you Miss Marsh? Right now, I think I'm dead. You will be if you keep interrupting. Go ahead, Miss Marsh. Tell me about yourself. Certainly. I live in Muncie, Indiana. I arrived this morning for a two-week vacation. I'm well known back there, and you can find out everything about me if you care to wire. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, how did you happen to meet Mr. Holliday here? Look, Lieutenant, if you'll permit me to tell you... I'm asking the lady. I went to school with his mother. That's what I did. Uh Huh? See... Well, I guess it was the work of some would-be comic. But I had to investigate it just the same. Well, of course you do. Oh, but Kling, listen. Goodbye, Miss Marsh. So long, Holiday. But Kling, wait, I want to go with you. Why don't you two have a fast game of hearts? Mr. Holiday, wasn't that thrilling? Just like in the magazines. Miss Marsh, you're going to stay in this room until I get Kling back here. Oh, no, no, no. I want to solve this case myself. I wonder how Kling found out that Miss Marsh. Yes. I'm not the suspicious type, you understand, but a little bird, a a tiny little bird, has intimated that perhaps you might know who tipped off the lieutenant. Of course I know. It was I. What in the world are you doing? I made the call from the corner drugstore a little while ago. I wanted to throw the lieutenant off the trail, like they say. You know what I say? No, what? You're going down to police headquarters and tell the truth. Oh, just a second. Excuse me, please. Yes? Yes, this is Miss Marsh. Oh, you did? I thought so. Yeah, it should have had 817 instead of this room. Oh, no, don't bother. I like it here. I knew it. I knew it all the time. What did you know? That was the room clerk. He got my reservation mixed up. I was supposed to get 817, and I got 718 instead. You mean the person who killed Michael O'Brien wanted to get back in here to remove the body? No, 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 it doesn't sound reasonable. No, it doesn't. Uh, well, guess who was supposed to get this room? Never mind, we're going to police headquarters. It was Tony Bascari. Tony Bascari? He's the biggest racketeer in town. He's dynamite. Miss Marsh, he's deadly. I know, Mr. Holliday, and I love it. Oh, no, no. <laughs> You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. (laughs) 
two o'clock in the morning and I can't go to sleep. Oh, that little old girl has me worried to death. She wouldn't go to the police headquarters, and when I went down and talked to Kling, he acted as though it were a big joke and sent me on my way. Hello. This is Agatha Marsh. Now what? Where are you? At the hotel. I went up to see Tony Bascari. You what? Miss Marsh, don't you know that's the worst thing you could have done? I had to talk with him. I put the heat on him, as they say in the murder mysteries. And you're still alive? I accused him of killing that O'Brien man. I came right out with it. But of course, he wouldn't admit a thing. What do you expect him to do, break down and confess? Well, I think I've got him on the run. But I'm worried. Oh, if I had Tony Bascari on the run, I'd be worried too. Because when I came back, I discovered someone had searched my room. Will you call the police? You should have done it a long time ago. Oh, no, 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 I couldn't. I want you to come over right away. At two in the morning? Mr. Holliday, someone's trying my door. Hang up quick. Call the room clerk. But, Mr. Holliday, I'd... Hurry, I said. A dear little meddlesome old fool. Into your clothes, Holliday, because here we go again. And don't forget your boy Scott badge. You'll make the Beaver Patrol tonight. The clerk said she hadn't called the desk. I wonder... No, she would have screamed. Someone would have heard her. It's open. Cleaned out completely. No Miss Marsh, no clothes, no nothing. Not even a piece of notepaper. Hey, what's this? Paper airplane. Like the ones I used to make in school. But why should she be making paper airplanes? Airplanes. The airport, that's where they took her. Keep that motor running, I'll be right back. Not many people around this hour of the night. Oh, there she is. And the man with her has his hand in his pocket, and I don't think it's there because it's cold. What I need now is a little fast talk and a little faster action. Okay, I'll take over from here. Uh, who are you? What are you talking about? The old doll. Bascari wants her back. Bascari told me to put her on a plane. I'm doing it. Yeah? He changed his mind. He wants her back. I don't think so. Besides, I never saw you before. I told you, if you don't turn her over, Bascari might get sore. Why didn't he call me? It's only a half hour ago. I was still at the hotel. He could have called. And spilled everything over our phone. You nuts? This don't sound right. Yeah, forget it. I'm taking the old doll back with me. Wait a minute. I'm gonna call Tony first. Go ahead, stupid. Get your ears burned off. Who are you calling, stupid? Show me something that'll prove Tony sent you. Got a match? Stop stalling. This is a gun in my pocket. Let's talk to Tony. Yeah, I, I've got some matches here. Thanks. Yeah. Oh! Get him, Mr. Holiday, quick. I'm coming. Oh, not so fast. Oh, I'm not as young as I used to be. You should have remembered that before you got mixed up in this. Come on, get in. Would you push? Driver, get out of here fast. What did you do to that guy anyway? I, I stuck him with my hat pin. I might have guessed it. Now, Miss Marsh, what happened at the hotel? Well, I hung up when I heard him trying the door, but I was too late. The door was unlocked. So it was Tony Bascari, huh? He wanted you out of town fast. Oh, but they were very nice to me. You can thank your lucky stars for that. Usually, Bascari's enemies wind up in some ditch. I didn't see him again. That man, the one you knocked out at the airport, he was the one who came in my room. Well, you must have the goods on Bascari. You must have killed this man or had him killed. But why didn't he take him out of the hotel right away? But there was a convention there last night. The whole place was literally crawling with people. Oh, that's the reason. Oh, that paper airplane. That was fast thinking, Miss Marsh. Oh, uh -huh. well, thank you. <laughs> Well, yeah, now we can go back to Bascari. We've got the goods on him. We can crack the cakes like they say in the murder mysteries. Miss Marsh, I've got news for you. We're not going to see Bascari. We're not? 
Well, where are we going? You'll hate me, I know, but it's the police station. Well, Holiday, what happens now? You've taken Miss Marsh to Kling's office. She looks at him. He nods her into his private office. And suddenly she comes out smiling. You try to leave, only Kling stops you. You stay here, Holiday. Kling, you can't let her walk the streets alone. Bass Curry will get her. Forget it. I got a man tailing her. Okay, okay, but what happened in that office? What did she tell you? Plenty, my friend. She preferred charges against you. She preferred charges against me? Now, what are you talking about? Kidnapping. I kidnapped her? You took her off the plane by force, didn't you? Listen, Kling, that little old lady is a whodunit happy. She'll get herself killed. There really was a body in the hotel, you know. Look, Holiday, do you know what you're saying? Sure, I know what I'm saying. There really was a body in that hotel. Holiday, why didn't you tell me? I tried to, twice. Once in the room and the last time when I came in here. Now think, Holiday, carefully. Where is the body? In a broom closet down the hall. I put it there. You put it there? Yes, I put it there. Holiday, get out of here. <laughs> Well, Holiday, now you're fixed. Even Kling looked at you like those things in your belfry weren't bats. They're more like eagles. But you're in it now, so you've got to follow through. And that indicates a fast ride over to the Bradford Hotel. Oh, clerk. Hey, clerk. Uh, yes? I'd like to find out who occupied Agatha Marsh's room the day before she did. Uh, that question is highly irregular. Oh? Then here's a $10 bill that's highly regular. Oh, <clears throat> uh, let me think. Uh, she has 718. She checked in day before yesterday. Yes? The man who had the room before that was a traveling salesman in uh, lady suits, I believe. Uh, you must have cut quite a figure. She must be in this hotel someplace. Her room's empty, but she must be around. But where? What are you worrying about, Holiday? You couldn't wait to get rid of her. Now you can't wait to get her back. Oh, you're a character who belongs back in the Middle Ages with a tin union suit for cold nights. Yeah, she'll probably show up safely with that detective tailing her. The broom closet. Wonder if the dead man is still in there. He must be. Kling hasn't showed up yet. Oh, oh, oh hello, Mr. Holiday. Miss Marsh, what happened? How'd you get in that closet? Isn't this thrilling? No, it isn't. There was a detective trailing me, but he was knocked unconscious. Shopped, as they say in the murder mysteries. And you were brought up here? By the same man who tried to put me on the plane. He hit the detective, put me in the car, and brought me here. Well, you two, what are we playing now? And where is the man I put on you, Miss Marsh? He was hit over the head, Lieutenant, but I'm sure he's all right now. This is the closet where you said the body was? Was is right, Lieutenant. Yeah, let me take a look. You know what I think, Holiday? What? I think both of you crackpots are making this all up. I don't believe there ever was a body. Kling, you have my word for it. Your word doesn't mean as much as a Chinese dollar. Kling, listen. They brought her back here, locked her up. They took the body away, didn't they, Miss Marsh? Probably going to sink it in cement, as they say in the murder mysteries. Bascari's in his room, I'll bet. Go up and talk to him. Surely, put the heat on him. Just... Once more, I'll play with you kiddies. Come along. Where? Miss Marsh's room. I'm locking you pixies in till I get to the bottom of this. Kling's been gone 15 minutes. I wonder what's happening up there. Not much. I haven't heard any shooting. No, that's... I haven't heard any... In that case, how could a man be shot here and that shot not be heard? Oh, it's very easy, Mr. Holliday. The, the killer would use this. Oh, Miss Marsh, now where'd you get that gun? Just took it out of the drawer. It was here all the time. Well, put it down until Kling returns. But I just want to show you why the shot wouldn't be heard. What do you mean? Would you excuse me, please? You see this bath towel, Mr. Holliday? Yes, what about it? Well, a smart person would take the gun like this. Wrap the bath towel around it like this. 
You know, Miss March, you found out a lot since you came here. Oh, yes, I've done all right since early this morning. Early this morning? But the clerk said... I talked to Tony Biscari and he said... Clean, look out! You must watch me that thing. You shouldn't have moved, Mr. Holliday. I was really shooting at you. What's this all about, Holliday? What was she doing with that gun in her hand? She was going to kill me, just like she killed Michael O'Brien. That little old lady killing somebody... Miss March, you, you did kill him, didn't you? Then you called me, and you got Kling to come up here and catch me dragging the body away. Only he came a little late, as usual. Now, wait a minute, Holiday. Then when you couldn't pin it on me, you tried to hang it on Tony Biscari. Now, what did you do with the body? Dragged it back to the closet in this room. Oh. And I suppose you sat the detective who followed you, too. It was easy. I got him to turn around and hit him over the head with my purse. Why did you kill Michael O'Brien? Did you have something against him? No, no, I never saw him before. Then why kill a perfect stranger? I saw a play once. I liked those ladies in that play. They killed lots of people. I wanted to also. Only I should have done it like the ladies. You don't mean arsenic and old lace. Yes, and I should have worn the lace and given you the arsenic. <laughs> Well, Holiday, you're back in your apartment again. The sun is shining through the window, a sun you might never have seen again. You know, I've got an idea for you, Holiday. Give up this business and go into something quiet, like night watchman in a cemetery. Holiday. Uh, well, what's that, Kling? They examined the old girl down at the psychopathic ward of the city hospital. She's batty as a loon. You're telling me. I saw that in her eyes when she wrapped the towel around that gun. But uh, what happened to Bascari and his stooge? When she heard he was in the room above, she tried to pin the body on him. Oh, so he tried to get her out of town in self-defense. Hmm. Holiday, you're a very lucky, lucky guy. You can say that again and again. And again. Oh, just a minute. Hello, Mr. Holiday. Susie, what are you doing up here in my apartment? Why aren't you down at the Star Times? Well, my boss and I have been talking about another compromise. Another one? He wants to fire me, and I want to quit. Oh, but Susie, if you left the paper, what would I do for my mail? I was thinking... Maybe you'd like to hire a good combination stenographer and secretary, huh? That's you? That's me. Well, I don't know, Susie, but as they say in murder mysteries, I'll have to think it over. You better think fast. Good help is hard to find. Goodbye, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music was composed and conducted by Rody Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. The Black-Eyed Kids are an urban legend of vast proportions. The stories of small children turning up on people's doorsteps all across the world, spreading fear and terror, have only increased over time. This compilation of G. Michael Vasey's books on this scary phenomena include new material and new true stories, as well as the complete texts of The Black-Eyed Demons Are Coming and The Black-Eyed Kids. Supernatural expert G. Michael Vasey carefully investigates this truly terrifying phenomenon using real-life encounters with these scary supernatural beings. The result 
is an unsettling and sometimes terrifying book that'll have you fearfully anticipating that knock at your door late at night. Who and what are these mysterious visitors to the doorstep? Are they demons? Aliens? What do they want? Why do they need to enter your home? And what happens if they do? Small kids that ask to use your phone or for a ride, and yet those who encounter them are scared to death even before they notice their black eyes. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. In our 2007 book, The Yowie, Tony Healy and I noted the distinct lack of physical evidence. Unlike its American counterpart, the Yowie appears to be incredibly light on its feet, with very few track reports. Tony and I often theorized why this might be the case. Perhaps the drier climate, coarser soil, or the smaller population available to find tracks. Of course, there was always the possibility that there never was an animal there to leave tracks in the first place. In my four decades of research, I've only seen what might have been Yowie tracks on two occasions, both near the small town of Kempsey in northern New South Wales. The first was in January 1995, and the second was in 2015. The 2015 case was probably human, while the 1995 report still puzzles me. The location was a dirt road bordering the Ballangara State Forest, approximately 11 kilometers southwest of Kempsey, New South Wales. The date was Sunday, January 22, 1995. The time, 5.30 p.m., daylight saving time. The two young witnesses were Romney, 11 years old, and James, 10, both surnames on file. Both Romney and James had been playing with a neighbor's son on her property. Around 5.30, they decided to walk the short distance back to Romney's parents' property, about one or two kilometers. The dirt track from the neighbor's house runs up the side of a hill. After two property gates, the track joined a public dirt road that runs along the top of a ridgeline. On one side of the road are a few scattered properties, and on the other, steep, wooded gullies that fringe the Ballangara State Forest. After the boys had passed through the last gate, they turned left and started walking downhill along the road towards the junction with Piper's Creek Road. About a hundred meters from the neighbor's property gate, the boys heard some noises. James thought it may have been sheep or goats, and Romney felt it was a bird. Romney also said he heard two heavy footfalls at this point. After the noises, both boys looked ahead down the road and noticed a figure standing about five to seven meters away, in amongst the fern and lantana bushes that fringed the embankment on the left-hand side of the road. The creature was slightly hunched over and facing away from the boys. As they watched, it straightened up and began moving its head from side to side. Romney felt the creature was sniffing. Their descriptions were as follows. Romney said, the creature was eight to nine feet tall and totally covered in dark brown or black hair. Its hair was several inches long, wild and scraggly looking. It was way bigger than an average person. It seemed to be in between a human and a gorilla, as it was not quite the shape of a human and not quite the shape of a gorilla. It was a lot wider than a human. It was massive, neck of average length, no facial features were noted, nor arms or legs. James reported, dark browny color, dark, pretty high, long wild hair all over it, did not see arm or legs, just the back of a big hairy thing, resembled a monkey or a gorilla. After only a few seconds, the boys turned around and began to walk, and then run back to their neighbor's property. Romney said he heard footsteps as they moved away from the animal. They both said they were very frightened. They told one of their older friends at the neighbors and later asked him to drive them home as they refused to walk back past the spot where the animal had stood. 
The neighbor's mother heard the story from the boys the next day and decided, at their insistence, to visit the spot. She was amazed to discover a series of long, broad tracks at the site. Although still skeptical, Irene later discussed the sighting with Dave Renicky of Kempsey, who, via Fortean colleague Bill Chalker, passed on the report to me. I traveled to Kempsey on Saturday the 4th of February, 1995, and initially spoke with the neighbor's mother. While skeptical, she had been impressed by the boys' continued insistence that they really had seen the creature. She told me the boys were still spun out the next morning, and they wanted her to go up to the spot with her to look around. We then both visited the site of the encounter where a number of broad, deep impressions were still visible on the overgrown track next to the dirt road. I took several photos, then we moved on to Romney's property where I interviewed him at length about his sighting. Romney's story impressed me. He was an intelligent, articulate, and apparently very level-headed 11-year-old. His account of his experience was succinct, and several efforts on my part to lead him into extra details proved fruitless. It's interesting to note that it was Romney's account that made their neighbor feel that there may have been something to the boy's claims. She felt that Romney just would not make up such a story. Later that afternoon, I again visited the site and took more photos and measurements as well as two casts of the clearer impressions. That evening, I spoke to the other boy, James. James was not as articulate as Romney, but he confirmed all of the major details in Romney's story. It was interesting to note that it seemed clear to me that James had not spoken much about his experience. His mother and father appeared quite surprised at the details that came out during our interview. Although two weeks had elapsed since the sighting and the fact that there had been rain locally, I was able to locate 16 impressions around the site of the boys' sighting and took two plaster casts. These imprints stretched from the top of the slope and continued in a definite trail along the track down to where the animal was seen standing. The impressions were roughly an oval shape, although with one end slightly wider than the other, but no distinct toes. The distance between prints varied from 50 to 100 centimeters. There were larger gaps between prints, however, these may have been due to the nature of the ground, as some areas would not have shown tracks. The average length of the imprints was 30 centimeters long by 18 centimeters wide. Almost all of the prints were around 3 to 4 centimeters deep. By comparison, if I stood on my boot heel with my entire weight, I made a 2 centimeter heel impression. The soil at the bottom of the prints was quite flat and hard packed. No arch or ball was visible. However, one cast shows what could be the rounded ball of a foot. It's interesting to note that while the imprints did not immediately resemble human feet, both casts have the general shape of a large foot. Around four hours after I took the two casts, I left both prints with David Renicky as I went to interview James. Both of the plaster casts still had a substantial amount of soil attached to the plaster as I had only given them a partial clean. On my return, David told me that his dog, a poodle Maltese cross, had reacted in an unusual manner to the casts as they lay in the middle of their lounge room. David and I decided to attempt to duplicate the animal's reaction, but first we placed a large lump of wood in the middle of the room to see how the dog would normally react to the presence of something unusual. The animal seemed uninterested in the wood and happily ran all around the room. The dog and the log were then removed and one cast was placed in the room. The dog again was allowed in and its reaction was immediate. It stayed one to two meters away and simply stared at the cast. It continued to stare for at least one or two minutes and then it bared its teeth and commenced growling and then barking at the print. David, who was sitting on the opposite side of the cast, attempted to call the dog over to him but the animal refused to budge. The dog continued this behavior for as long as the cast was in the room. David's other dog showed no interest in the cast. David told me he believed that the dog had always been particularly sensitive to animal sense. He also indicated the dog had only acted this way once or twice before, always at items with definite animal origins. 
A few days after my visit to the area, I attempted to interest Port Macquarie National Parks and Wildlife staff in inspecting the tracks. I was unsuccessful, but was referred on to a Port Macquarie-based wildlife research consultant of 30 years' experience. This consultant visited the site on the weekend of February 11th and 12th with four others. He inspected the tracks, which were still clearly visible despite further heavy rain. He told me later that he was able to locate four tracks further down the slope, yet a wider search revealed no additional impressions. He found no hair samples or indications that any large animal had made its way through the bush. The consultant indicated that he believed that whatever had made the tracks had weighed around half a ton. Each track was heavily compressed at each end. However, there was a strip in the center of each imprint where the soil was not heavily packed down. Strangely, he did not believe the tracks were related to what the two boys had seen. So, 24 years later, do I believe Yowie left those strange imprints? I remember being impressed by the boys' stories and something big, heavy, and bipedal had certainly walked down that isolated bush trail. A few years ago, I tracked down Romney and asked him again about his experience. He said he couldn't even remember it. When it comes to the Yowie, what seems like solid evidence eventually just seems to slowly fade from view and disappear. But I do still have those casts. I am an avid woodworking kind of guy and had a really nice wood shop in my basement. Usually, I would have all my wood products stacked in correct order so as to not have to look for a piece I was needing. One day I went down to the basement and saw some of my wood moved from their correct places. I put them back in place and started making a piece for either my wife or my daughter. When I would finish, sometimes I would leave scraps on the bench and clean up later. After getting back home from shopping with my wife or just out for some fun, I'd go back down and begin working on the piece. I got downstairs and saw some of the scraps had been moved. Not thinking, I just placed them in the trash can and went about working. When finished, I cleaned up the area so as to not have to worry about doing it when I had to start on another piece. The next day, I'd gone down and saw some of the pieces that I'd placed in the trash were scattered on the workbench. I put the scraps back in the trash and emptied them outside in the dumpster. A few days later, I started a new project and again I left some of the scraps on the bench. My wife had called out to me to go shopping with her, so I stopped what I was doing and went shopping. We came back home, she put away the groceries, and I went back down. I noticed some of the wood I was preparing to work with had been on the floor. I know no one was home at the time, so before I did anything else, I took pictures of the mess. After, I cleaned up the wood and started back doing the project. Once it was finished, I cleaned up the basement and put everything back where they were supposed to be. One night, while sitting up in the living room, I heard a noise down in the basement. I went down and saw some of the wood was moved. I called out to my daughter to come and see. She went down with me and said, what's wrong? I said, I'd put all this wood back in place and now look at it. She thought I was kidding and laughed. I said, I know I put it all back. She suggested I place a recorder down in the basement and let it run all night. So I got my recorder and set it on the workbench and let it run all night long. The next morning, after I got up and had coffee, my daughter and I went back down and took the recorder back upstairs. We started playing the recording, and after about 10 minutes, we heard wood hitting the floor. Some were being thrown against the wall and some were thrown on the floor. This went on for about 35 minutes and then stopped. After that, my daughter told me something that was very interesting. She said sometimes, when she was downstairs changing her clothes, she heard a voice coming from the far side of the basement. She said it startled her and ran back up. This house I know was haunted by several spirits. 
a little girl and two adult men. My daughter used to call her Neela and one of the men Dennis. The other said that she was mischievous and would do things like hide things or just being a total turd. There were times he would go up the stairs to the bedrooms and just peek just above the landing at my daughter. After a while, she got used to it and would tell him to go away, and he would. These things which happened in the house is just a few of what went on, and in time I'll tell you some more. Until then, thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness, aside from the old-time radio shows, are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.